Good morning. Welcome to our ninth annual Reg Regional Economic Forum. My name is Carl Guardino, CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and Executive Director of our Silicon Valley Leadership Group Foundation. We want to thank our nearly 400 participants for joining us today via Zoom. Throughout this morning, we will be tackling some of the most pressing issues facing our region and state, each made even more complex in a COVID-19 environment. Our regional economic forum would not be possible without our 24 equally branded co-hosts and the generosity of our branded sponsors. Please note on your screen our branded sponsors, Silicon Valley Bank, United Airlines, Western Digital, Summerhill Homes, Republic Urban, the Santa Clara County Office of Education, the Northern California Council of Carpenters, California Forward, Hillspire, Deloitte, and San Jose State University. We want to thank each of these sponsors for making today possible in our virtual format via Zoom. We also want to thank our amazing co-hosts who helped build this valley in a more equitable fashion for all of us. Those 24 co-hosts are on your screen. We usually clap once for each of them. So if you want to get your exercise this morning, join me as I mention a co-host and then we'll clap together. BIA Bay Area, the California Apartment Association, Catholic Charities, Cities Association, City of San Jose, Eden Housing, Hospital Council, Housing Leadership Council, Housing Trust Silicon Valley, Innovate Schools, MTC, Nonprofit Housing Association, Northern California Carpenters Regional Council, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, the San Mateo County Economic Development Association, Santa Clara County, Santa Clara County Association of Realtors, the Santa Clara County Office of Education, Save San Francisco Bay, Silicon Valley at Home, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, Spur, Valley Water, and the Valley Transportation Authority. It is a pleasure to introduce a longtime partner and ally who will provide context as to how our regional economic forum fits into our annual statewide economic summit. The CEO of California Forward, someone who has already done so much for our region and state, please join me in welcoming Micah Weinberg. Micah? Thank you, Carl. Um, so uh, as Carl mentioned, I'm Micah Weinberg, the CEO of California Forward. Uh, we are a statewide movement to make California's government and economy work for everyone. The most important thing that I want to emphasize today in, in my brief remarks is that Carl, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, uh, and all of you uh, listening today are essential parts of this statewide movement. So one of the central activities that we do is uh, the California Economic Summit. This is a year-round effort that culminates in a major event at the end of the year. Uh, and uh, brings together leaders of all the different sectors in the state to develop solutions to California's most pressing problems um, from housing to water to workforce development. The summit has been put on as a collaboration between California Forward and the California Stewardship Network. Uh, this is a group of triple bottom line regional economic development leaders, uh, such as our friend Carl Gardino. Um, as of last year, uh, we integrated these groups and California Forward became the statewide backbone organization for the stewardship network. Um, so whether or not we do a summit, which is in Monterey, uh, as we desperately hope that it will be, or a series of regional summits or a uh, virtual summit, this work that you are all hearing about and doing today uh, directly feeds into the work of the California Economic Summit. You all here today, but also groups uh, that we are coordinating with from the Imperial Valley to the Redwood Coast are having regional meetings that will help create a statewide plan that we call the Roadmap to Shared Prosperity to help guide the state as it moves forward. 
So thank you for all the work uh, that you do to create inclusive, sustainable growth in Silicon Valley. So I just want to conclude quickly on what this all means in this moment. First, I think it's really important to understand that we do not want an economic recovery in the state of California. What do I mean by that? Well, recovery implies that we will get back what we had, but the economy that we had was deeply inequitable along racial and geographic lines, and there were plenty of other problems, including many needless and counterproductive regulations that make the state a challenging place to be a business owner, especially an entrepreneur uh, starting a small business. So we don't need an economic recovery, but we do need an economic renewal in California. And the best way to do this is to have our policy start and be anchored in regions, because it is these regions like Silicon Valley that structure our economic and social lives. And then we need to make sure that we're tracking this progress by region, building up to the state, and so we have a tool that we've developed called the California Dream Index that makes sure that as we are moving through this period, as we are developing a new economy, we're developing one that's much more equitable, that's much more uh, uh, consistent with inclusive and sustainable growth, much more environmentally friendly. And this work today that you are doing is an essential part of that. So thank you so much for all of this. Carl, thank you so much for having me. Um, at the top of the order here, and I'm really looking forward to the presentations today. Micah Weinberg, it is such a pleasure to work with you. We appreciate your timely remarks and your visionary agenda to strengthen our regions as well as our state. We want to, uh, we want to move forward with our first panel on the challenging issue of housing and homelessness. Our uh, intro, uh, uh, our person introducing this panel uh, may uh, or may not be connected on the phone. I'm going to ask, is Pat Saucedo on the line? If Pat Saucedo is not on the line, we will thank her again and BIA Bay Area for their tremendous work to make sure that we have homes for our residents throughout the region and state. And let me fill in for Pat Saucedo to introduce this illustrious panel on housing and homelessness with a bent towards solutions. With that, let me introduce our moderator for this panel, Leslie Corselia, the Executive Director of SV at Home. Leslie will be introducing our panel. We will have a timekeeper from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, my colleague Christophe Labelle. Christophe will be helping our panel and our moderator to stay on time with the time limits so that very quickly, we can get to near our nearly 400 guests with your interactive conversation and questions to communicate your questions. You're actually going to be texting my cell phone so that I can text those on to our moderator, Leslie Corselia. My cell phone number is 408-838 four eight four eight i'm going to repeat that text me at four zero eight eight three eight four eight four eight and in that way i can communicate with our moderator leslie corselia in this new virtual world in which we are all uh, moving forward leslie corselia i'll turn it over to you Thank you, Carl, and good morning. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I would like to introduce uh, this great panel that we have today uh, with uh, Sam Licardo, Mayor of the City of San Jose, Kevin Zwick, the Chief Executive Officer of the Housing Trust Silicon Valley, Roseanne Faust, the President and CEO of the San Mateo County Economic Development Association, Michael Van Avery, who is the president and managing partner of Republic Urban Properties, 
Mariko Sayak, who's the council member for the city of Los Gatos, and Robert Freed, who is the president and CEO of Summerhill Housing Group. Uh, just as a start, I just wanted to, to say good morning and thank you and thank you, Carl. Uh, you know, for many years, uh, Silicon Valley has been the epicenter of, of the nation's housing crisis. And with COVID-19 coming in, this is just uh, complicated, uh, like, uh, and it's impacting really all parts of the housing market. So today, uh, we're going to talk housing and solutions. We have very little time, so I'm going to jump right in with the first question. And the first question is for Mayor Licardo. Uh, so Mayor Licardo, you've been quite open and transparent about the city's budget challenges due to COVID-19. While continuing uh, to actively champion city and regional efforts to tackle both homelessness and affordable housing, how are you going to advance an expansive housing agenda while managing the contracting COVID-19 budget reality? Well, thanks, Leslie, and, and thanks for all your leadership and great work at SV at Home. Uh, there's no question we're all facing headwinds, both in the market rate side as well as uh, for those of us who are trying to find ways to fund affordable housing. I think if there is any good news, it is that there will still be sources of affordable funding. Uh, and uh, some of those new and old sources, that is, we expect there'll be some federal stimulus money that may be available, and we're certainly going to continue to lobby for very very heavily. Uh, Measure E, which just passed in San Jose uh, just a few weeks ago, by the way, with great leadership of, of Leslie and SV at home. I'm uh, grateful for that. Uh, Measure A will continue to be able to provide funding here in Santa Clara County for affordable projects. And so there are some sources out there we can go to. Uh, we know that the capital markets are going to be uh, pretty locked up, I would expect, for some time on market rate. Uh, but, and it will be, you know, time will tell whether that's going to affect our ability to get access, for example, to low income housing tax credits and whether that demand is going to be sufficient to be able to generate a lot. But I think there are going to be funding sources and we're just going to need to be more resourceful. Uh, the, the good news is in, in downtimes, as we know, if there's any um, silver lining, it's that you do have opportunities with some lower cost structures. Uh, maybe land costs don't drop as much as we'd like to be able to get access to land to be able to bank to build housing, uh, but certainly labor uh, and, um, and capital costs certainly drop as we're seeing very low interest rates now. Uh, there may be market rate projects that are already entitled that will be looking for opportunities for essentially a bailout uh, that we can then come in and, and take on. Um, and you know, there's a lot we can do to prepare for what may be coming in the next wave. And, you know, that includes buying the land, a land banking, getting a lot of planning done. We all need to do that in our own cities, clearing a lot of backlogs and permitting and planning. And that's something I'm really laser focused on, make sure that we can get uh, things moving as quickly as possible when the light starts to turn green. Um, and, and really leveraging a lot of the innovations that we're using more and more uh, in all of our cities uh, in this virtual world. Uh, we're now doing a lot of inspections virtually with the, the help of cameras. Uh, we're taking more and more permits uh, and, and issuing more and more permits online. Uh, we're taking, uh, we'll be taking electronic plans like many cities in the months ahead as well. And so we're hoping all those things uh, can be really put in place that'll help everybody to move faster. That's gonna be really important in eliminating obstacles. Uh, like for example, the one we have in San Jose where we have 24,000 units of housing that we could be building right now in North San Jose uh, if we can just resolve this issue with the city of Santa Clara. So we're going to work really hard on trying to get a lot of those obstacles out of the way. Uh, the last thing I just say, I think the opportunity is in this crisis is really being able to use the emergency orders that we have to move more quickly. Um, uh, here in the city of San Jose, we've got three or four sites where we're going to be building prefab modular housing. Uh, and with the benefit of some waivers of CEQA laws uh, at the state level with the, with the funding that the governor has issued uh, and waiver uh, some city processes that frankly uh, we know as every developer knows is really puts an extraordinary amount of delay and costs on every project. You know, we could go build uh, as we're, we're starting construction today on uh, 80 units of prefab modular housing for homeless. We're gonna get those built in four weeks and they'd ordinarily take four years to build. And we're not going to stop there. We've got another two to 300 units we think we can build. Uh, and we've also got some folks who are very interested uh, in, 
and philanthropically supporting that as well. So this is a real moment of opportunity for us if we use it well, and I really want to dive in. So I think that's great. The, the idea of taking this moment in time and, and finding the silver linings, I think that we're learning a lot uh, and really appreciate uh, all the, that of your leadership, Mayor. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, to pivot to uh, one of our smaller cities in, in uh, Las Gatas uh, and ask Council Member Sayok uh, to talk a little bit about the challenges uh, from a small city perspective and you know, one of the biggest uh, projects in the Valley has been the North 40 mixed use development. Really interested in how uh, your community uh, worked on that project to get it to move forward and what challenges you've had. Sure, thank you, Leslie, and good morning, everyone. Um, I wanna thank you for that question because it acknowledges that smaller cities in the Bay Area also have to step up and provide their housing. When our project is done, um, our project in conjunction with Summerhill will be able to provide 320 more units to the housing stock, 50 of those with senior affordable housing. Those are in the building permit stage, um, and I can let Robert fill in on the specifics of that status, but we're hopeful that construction will begin, um, uh, if not fall, but early, early winter. Uh, but I don't want to gloss over the fact that there was significant community division to get us to this point, and it required legal intervention. One of the key things I think that was very helpful for my council was to really understand what the Housing Accountability Act, what it entails, and really what are the standards that local elected officials can use to allow or disallow a project. I know personally for myself, that clarification was tremendous in helping press the reset button, move this project project forward and it's been something substantive that my um, that I've been working on with my colleagues through Cities Association so that we have planning collaboratives where we have factual information to help other elected officials and it's it's vital for forums like these to really have opportunities to share that information and really to provide support and encouragement when you have to make those decisions in the face of community opposition. Uh, Robert, did you want to say a little about the project, the North 40 project? Well, I'm never bashful. So um, first of all, we're fortunate to, to be involved in the project. It's, it's been frustrating for numerous reasons um, that it has taken this long. We, uh, I think we got involved in the project in 2012. We're in 2020 and we haven't got a stick in the air. Uh, we hope to go vertical on the project in uh, maybe a little earlier than um, just mentioned, but I think summertime we possibly will see sticks in the air. And, you know, the bottom line is that as a community and as a state, in my opinion, we have not recognized that um, housing is an imperative. We have um, too much ideology and politics that get in the way of producing housing. We have a housing shortage. And I have some street credibility. I've sat on the Santa Clara County Housing Authority. I'm on the board of Bridge Housing, building affordable housing. I've been in the market rate. Prices are too high and rents are too high because we don't build enough housing. And so until we decide as a state and a community that it's an imperative, and make it an imperative, we're gonna to continue to, to deal with this really difficult situation. And I would hope that coming out of this really dramatic change in our lives with this pandemic, that perhaps we can in fact change the dialogue. Leslie, you're on mute. Sorry, I, I pressed the wrong, at the wrong time. Uh, it's interesting, this week we had a case in, uh, in Los Altos, a court case that uh, overturned a decision that the city had made. And, and it's thought that that's going to help with some of the, the, um, the difficulty it is for getting projects through, but we'll see. Um, um, I'm gonna uh, move on to, um, to Roseanne and ask her, uh, she's a former Redwood City Council member um, as well as her current job. And she brings a, really a rich texture of both the public and private sectors to this discussion. 
How do you think we can build more homes that are affordable to families on the peninsula, which currently has a significant in-commute from the East Bay and Central Valley? Leslie, thank you very much for moderating the panel today. Thank you to the fellow panelists. One of the initiatives that SAMHSA has been involved with for the last five years is something called Home for All. And it was started by our Board of Supervisors. It was designed to bring all the players to the table, for-profit developers, nonprofit developers, elected officials, the business community, and all those that would be interested in what Robert mentioned in terms of getting more housing built. We've been able to take the jobs housing imbalance down from 24 to one to 11 to one currently. Now that is by no means perfect. And we need more housing at all income levels to be able to support uh, the jobs that we had uh, pre-COVID-19 and then as we're coming out of this. I want to cite the city of Burlingame as kind of an ideal community. I mean, I can talk about Redwood City. When I was mayor, we built 2,500 housing units in our downtown right on the Caltrain line. So I think that's an important uh, item to bring up. But the city of Burlingame, which has 6,000 housing units in its general plan over the next 30 years, it has several housing units being constructed now, and they plan for another 3,000 in their general plan through a community engagement process that was designed and implemented with Home for All. So I think if more communities look at how they can better engage their communities, I think we can get more housing built. We've been able to prove it. Burlingame is a great example. Redwood City is a great example. And we just have to keep doing it. So thank you. Did any of the other panelists like to chime in? Michael? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to also thank Sam Cedar for all their hard work. We have one of the larger projects uh, in the San Mateo County region at the Millbrae BART station and Sam Cedar was uh, vital to getting the project approved, as well as facilitating the, the important gap financing necessary for affordable housing. So I want to thank them. I did want to point out that there is still a lot of nimbyism, specifically at some high levels on some councils that are, you know, preventing us from moving things forward. There's a one current council member in the city of Millbrae who now is taking her fight to a regional level to go against things like the, the Scott Wiener bills, the David Chu bills. And so it's important that we all work together with Sam Cita and others to make sure we can keep housing production at its highest levels in San Mateo County. Thank you, Michael. I'm gonna to move uh, to um, Kevin and ask him uh, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, corporations. We have world-class employers like Apple, Cisco, Facebook, Google, stepping up with million dollar donations. Uh, for affordable housing in our, our region and around uh, the Bay Area. Um, how are you partnering with these employers and others? And how has COVID-19 impacted your efforts to move developments forward? So kind of two different areas. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Let me answer the second one first. Um, so at the Housing Trust, we believe safe, stable, affordable housing opens the doors to better lives for everyone. And then since 2000, we've helped create over 20,000 housing opportunities for people from everyone experiencing homelessness to renters to first time home buyers. So right now, as we look at the pandemic and we look at the inequality and the inequity that COVID-19 has exposed, um, we're not backing away from our work. We remain dedicated as ever to our mission and to help support those who need the financial resources to create and preserve affordable housing. Um, and uh, in order to do that, we really have to scale, uh, we have to scale to meet the needs of this current housing crisis and what's going to be coming. Um, luckily, we have some um, resources available to us to meet the, the scale of the crisis. Um, and we've, we've scaled to meet that 20% of the $350 million we've invested in affordable housing over these past 20 years, we've done in just this past year. So we, we do have the scale to um, continue to address getting housing built, getting sites um, to our affordable housing developers, helping them get the resources they need to buy land. And you know, um, one of the main reasons we've been able to do this is the 
capabilities and financial partnerships we've had through our tech fund, um, where we've raised uh, over $112 million from Google, Cisco, NetApp, uh, Pure Storage, Sobrato Foundation, Packard Foundation, and others. Um, and then recently, the Apple Affordable Housing Fund. Uh, it's a $150 million fund for the entire Bay Area to help uh, this first round of money that we just put out. Um, and we got 52 proposals um, to help try to unstick projects that could be shovel ready. They just need another quick um, loan, a gap loan, so that they could start construction. So that's, that's what we're focused on right now. And we can do that because of the partnerships we have with technology companies. Any, any comments from any other panelists? Uh, Sam? Yeah, you know, I think Kevin's done an extraordinary job, the Housing Trust, in really leveraging those, those commitments. I think another project we're working on with the Housing Trust could also be a great opportunity for a lot of companies that maybe can't give it the level of Apple or Google, uh, but want to have some impact, particularly with their own employees. And that is, we see extraordinary opportunity with backyard homes. And uh, we know we can get those units built at a fraction of the cost of a typical unit. Uh, and many employers undoubtedly have many employees who could use a little extra rental income. Uh, and in partnering with the Housing Trust, we're finding ways to reduce the financing costs for folks to be able to build a backyard home and, and be able to lease them up. This is a real win-win opportunity if employers want to help with the financing for their own employees, that is to get a backyard home built. Uh, we can keep them a little money if they uh, keep the rent restricted uh, and really create more uh, of an inventory of affordable housing for everybody. Thank you, Mayor. Um, now I'm gonna move to our two developer panelists. So um, Robert and Michael. Uh, home builders and the construction trades have long been respected for leadership in workplace safety. What additional steps are you taking to ensure worker safety in a COVID-19 world, especially as, as construction on uh, all projects gets to move forward? Go ahead, Robert. First. You are. Go ahead, Robert. Uh, well, I would say one thing is we're certainly learning on the fly. We, we didn't have any lessons in COVID-19 until very recently, but that said, a uh, collaborative effort with the California Building Industry Association, with contractors, subcontractors, uh, health professionals, and the, um, the order that came out this week that is allowing construction to start again on market rate has a whole set of very um, detailed policies and procedures to ensure safety. And um, all of the industry is now putting those policies and procedures in place. Um, you know, I got a Summerhill Construction Company health and safety booklet that was put together in the last two days. And so, um, you know, we're fortunate that working outside and then in, even in the units where you can get separation provides us some opportunities that other industries don't have. But it's, it's learning on the fly and it's um, putting these procedures and safety measures in place to ensure everyone's health and, and um, wellness. And Leslie, let me dovetail to Robert's comments. I, I woke this morning and uh, as I normally do, I pulled up my three newspapers uh, in this order, the Mercury News, the San Francisco Chronicle and the Wall Street Journal. And as I approached the end of the Mercury News, I was shocked and frankly pissed off at the editorial provided by the Mercury News that somehow housing construction, commercial construction now is a gamble. Those are the direct words from the editorial board from the San Jose Mercury News. So I hope the media is covering this. The work that's gone into the protocol of the amount of organizations, including the leadership group, SBO, SB at Home, the hard work we've gone to the protection of our employees, frankly, is offensive. I'm offended, Mercury News. Well, what else is new? I'm offended that somehow we're gambling the health risk of our employees, of our subcontractors. There was a coalition of over 23 to 24 people who worked at the highest levels of state government to the, to the county levels, to the city of San Jose. Is it going to make Mayor Licardo's job any easier if we sit on the sidelines in fear or are we going to be proactive and are we going to move forward as an industry in collaboration to affect the health issues that go associated with people that are unhoused? 
So how about that gamble, Mercury News? The health issues of unhoused people and what that consequences are in our society. It was disgusting. Thank you. Mayor, would you like to add? I just want to ask how Michael really feels. Uh, I, no, actually, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with the basic sentiment, which is, you know, the, the rules that were in place uh, made distinctions between some kind of construction and not others. And, and the reality is all construction can be made safe. There's been an enormous amount of collaboration, as Michael described well, and ensuring that rules will be in place. And I think everyone's going to be carefully watching to ensure those rules are followed. And I think we can do this safely. A lot of people need to get back to work. Uh, and some of those who are struggling the most are folks that we can help by, by getting them back on the site. Really? Oh, go ahead, Robert. Just a, just a quick comment. I, and I'm going to go back to something I said earlier. I think the kinds of comments that got Michael upset um, is th that's where the politics and the ideology is failing to recognize the importance of housing. There, there's risks in everything that we do. Um, but if we recognize that housing is an imperative and you put these smart policies and procedures in place, then the housing can move forward. And that, that's the kind of interaction we need in this community, but it starts with recognizing the importance of housing. So re really following up on that conversation, um, what, do you, what kind of changes would you like to see at the local or state level that would jumpstart home construction and do it safely, affordably, and quickly? What are some of the steps we can take? And, and uh, it's, we'll, we'll start with Mariko. You know, I think I want to address some of the things that have just been commented on. For local elected officials, more support to help with the smaller communities is really, I think, would be valuable. As I mentioned, the Cities Association, we're working on a planning collaborative to find like-minded elected officials who do want to move the needle forward. I think oftentimes it's easier to point, um, whether it's the Mercury News or another news organization, to, the, to those NIMBYists that are in in opposition. And again, the more we can do to help those that truly want to build housing um, and, and provide a support to those who want to make the hard decisions would be valuable. And oftentimes we just don't have the resources at a smaller city level to do all that work. Uh, to, uh, to Roseanne. So I totally agree with um, Mayor Sayak. That is why the Home for All community engagement piece has worked so well. In a city of Burlingame, which is you know, a relatively small city, we have 20 cities in San Mateo County, for them to approve a general plan that in essence over doubles their existing housing stock, that is leadership in my mind. I mean, that is true leadership. And the more that we can support communities doing that, housing is a right. It is a fundamental right. I think there is no one on this panel or in attendance that would uh, disagree with that comment. We need more housing at all income levels. And it's really beholden on us to find the leaders that are willing to do it. Uh, Michael, I think you had a comment. Yes, uh, and I just like to applaud. Honestly, I've seen during this pandemic, the city of San Jose and the mayor and the city council, the city manager should be very impressed with how uh, the staff is working, you know, tirelessly, not eight to five, you know, eight to midnight. Um, it's, it's fun to watch. I will say too, from a procedure perspective, AB uh, 3594, the streamline, city of San Jose is, is providing that for signature projects. We're, we're actually going right into, you know, final approval through director's hearings. So again, it's those types of, you know, laws that now we need implementation, whether through HCD to focus its way to the local cities. And what I am seeing in some of the smaller city with respect is just not enough assistance to get those measures in place to have those policy procedures kind of implemented. I am confident, though, as the future rolls on, these will be in place and we'll see more streamlining. Yeah, Leslie. Sorry, sorry, you, I keep pressing it the wrong time. Uh, Robert, <laughs> did you have, did you have uh, a yeah, comment? Just a, and just and a quick Kevin? comment, and Roseanne has, has made a very good point. We, you know, we have three very large apartment projects, one under construction and two more coming in Burlingame. Very simple. 
our capital found a home where the city has done a, a lot of heavy lifting and provided a blueprint that would allow us to minimize a lot of the risk associated with development and move forward and produce you know, a large number of housing units. So they've done a tremendous job. And if we really want to stimulate housing, it requires mitigating the risk so that capital feels it is a safe or reasonably safe place to invest. Kevin, last uh, word before we go to, to uh, the questions from the public. Yeah, so I just wanted to just um, bring up a couple different perspectives on housing and homelessness right now. One is just to recognize the, the, um, the just the crisis level that we're seeing. Our, our partners who are working on the front lines of the homelessness crisis and seeing um, how challenging it's been for them, um, but how everyone stepped up to house um, all folks who um, in this pandemic who, who have uh, been exposed to coronavirus or are potentially exposed. So the, the work that the Office of Supportive Housing has been doing um, and all of the homeless providers to get people housed and what's really going to be needed to protect them, protect all of the renters, people who are living in affordable housing right now, is we all have to also push on the federal government to come in with massive amounts of money to help stabilize the rental market, um, especially for affordable housing. We have a lot of affordable housing developments that the city and others have invested in over the last 20, 30 years that are that are going to be at risk if the federal government doesn't come in with uh, rental assistance for those very low income renters and for the housing providers. I really thank Kevin for raising that because that's going to be a big push that we're going to have to have here in the, in the coming months is really how we deal with uh, with the need for significant infusion of new money. Um, I'm going to go, uh, jump to a question from the audience. And uh, so this uh, uh, panelist, just let me know if you want to be the one to answer. Uh, Joshua Baum from Hilgart Analytics asks, do you believe that the COVID-19 pandemic will make cities less attractive to live in as many of the advantages of being in cities, being closer to work and public events, simply don't exist as long as physical distancing requirements are in place? Well, I've got strong feelings about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember seeing the New York Times article came out last week suggesting that now everyone's going to flee the cities because of COVID. I, I don't think that's true. Um, first, I, I am optimistic that, you know, within some time in the next year or so, uh, you know, there'll be a vaccine and folks will feel safe again. Uh, but I think uh, really cities are at the edge of the, of the spear around the innovation that's going to be critical to help us stay safe and to be able to integrate um, uh, our social life in meaningful ways in a time of COVID. And, you know, I think about everything from uh, all the incredible apps are being developed now to help us with tracking and tracing, the uh, infrared sensors and so forth that are going to help us understand who's got a fever and who doesn't. I mean, those are, those are things that tend to roll out um, in dense urban areas first. I'd also say that there's opportunities for us to think differently about our space. You know, maybe we should be closing some streets and allowing people to dine outdoors uh, so that uh, we can actually help restaurants uh, and uh, uh, our community be able to get uh, back out there again. Obviously, that's not something we do today. We do it with the consent of the public health authorities. Uh, but those are the kinds of things I think cities can do very nimbly uh, and create great opportunities for folks to be able to re-engage again. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm clearly the wrong demographic to actually answer the question, but nevertheless, since you asked, um, I would suggest that the individual or family that wants to be in downtown San Jose or near downtown San Jose or, or San Francisco does not want to live in Lathrop. And so I, I think it would be foolish to abandon the, the, the notion that, you know, high quality urban living has died because of this virus. Well said. So we have a, a second question from the audience. Uh, I hear all these wonderful speakers, but I've not seen any results. Uh, Bay Area housing is skyrocketing. I'm a professional and cannot afford housing in the Bay Area. I would wish someone would be brave enough to admit we don't have the answer nor the means to fix the problem. So panel, what's the answer to fix the problem? We don't have the answer to fix the problem. We're working on the problem. We work on it every day uh, for to blanketly, you know, come, walk in our moccasins, uh, the elected official, the community 
person that's changing their life to live there, it's unfair for that to, for you to say that, you know, I'm sorry that you can't afford to live in, in where you want, but I can assure you the communities, the state, the nation in California is working together to provide these housing crises. Partly why I was so, you know, a little pointed about my comments about the Mercury News. This is exactly the point, is that there's a perception in the community and the business community that we're not doing enough. I can assure you, I can look at the eyes of every one of my panelists and we're all bloodshot and tired, but we're working harder during this pandemic. To, I, I bet the mayor and, and the mayor of Los Gatos and San Jose and others, you probably have slept three, four hours a night trying to figure these problems out. So my friend, that question is not fair. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to disagree with Michael. I think it's a very fair question because we're not producing enough housing. And why if if we were really serious, we would examine the top 10 impediments to housing and we would make some trade-offs and we say we no longer can do this and this and this if we want to produce housing. And it's there's frankly there's not enough political will in many jurisdictions to tackle it. And minority um, members of the community, meaning minority in number, um, have a disproportionate voice in their opposition of housing. And we don't have enough people showing up at public hearing demanding that these housing projects get approved. So it's, a, it's supply, basic economics, supply and demand. Well, and as uh, the moderator, I jump in and say, I totally agree with Robert. I think this is a very complicated topic and there's no one answer, but definitely we need political will and, and community support to be able to solve this. Mayor, I think you wanted to jump in. No, that, I think that um, all, all true. And, and, and certainly I, I agree with both sentiments. Uh, you know, look, there are a lot of people who are pushing very hard together at the same time. We do know what the solutions are and it takes will to get there. Uh, we need more housing, we need a lot more density in communities that may not be willing to embrace that. Um, we need some reforms at the state level around CEQA, uh, and uh, we could certainly uh, use more innovation at the local level uh, in, within our own governments to be able to help folks move through the process. I'm gonna ask one last question here, and then I think we, we're, our, our panel will be up, but, um, but uh, Bert from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation asks, can the panelists talk about solutions for ELI families and permanent supportive housing? Yeah, Kevin? can I jump in? Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, thanks for the question. It's the communities that are the, that are the hardest hit um, by the COVID, by coronavirus and this pandemic, not surprisingly, are people who were the most vulnerable to start with as well. Um, and the disproportionate impact on um, communities of color, on uh, people uh, who have, have had the least going in to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to this crisis are, are disproportionately being hurt. So the, the, the work that's being done in Santa Clara County uh, really is a model for the rest of the region and the state. Um, it started with the passage of Measure A back in 2016 so that we had the resources and we had the emphasis to say that this needs to go to those most vulnerable, those who were always at the back of the line when we were creating housing to begin with. So um, the solutions for permanent supportive housing and ELI, build a lot more housing um, and uh, make sure there's county resources um, and uh, other resources for the services to keep people housed. Um, and so Measure A has been a great success they're ahead of schedule. Um, there's uh, projects going up in almost every city in the county. Um, so, so we just need to build on that. Michael, you have the last word. Quickly, um, uh, the, we have some good partnerships with our regional transportation agencies, Barrier Rapid Transit, Valley Transportation Authority. Inside of those projects by transit stations, there's generally a requirement for 20% or higher uh, in the case of BART, they're actually de dedicating land. Those are getting to the higher affordability levels and allowing us to have more affordable housing. So I want to give a shout out to those two public transit agen agencies and SAMTRANS. Thank you very much. They're doing a good job with that effort. 
So I really want to thank our panel. I think we could have uh, taken the entire session talking just about housing. It's, it's a complicated issue. And I think the last word that I would leave you with is that we're going to need everybody who's listening in today and all of your friends and family and neighbors to help us with this, uh, with this challenge because it's going to be really a challenge moving forward uh, for the next year or two. So thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, Tess PLG. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Doug Goss, and I'm the president-elect for the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. I'd like to thank Leslie and all the great panelists for sharing with us this morning. Such great information and takeaways from this session. I'm happy to hear Mayor Licardo's positive take and the silver lining on this epidemic by possibly doing some land banking and having the funds available from Measure E and Measure A, even though credit is very tight at this time. Also, it's exciting to hear about what's going on in Los Gatos at North 40 with 320 homes coming on the market, as well as senior housing, plus the fact that they may be going vertical as early as the summer is exciting. It's been a long time coming and we look forward to its completion. And of course, there's Michael's uh, passionate commentary that we certainly all appreciate. Again, thank you everyone for sharing with us this morning. We're proud to be a partner of this event. Doug Goss, thank you. And to that amazing panel, it was fun to see how interactive that Leslie Corselia made it with our participants as well as with each other. That is the way that we want this to be throughout our time together. And as always, our Regional Economic Forum is an interactive and engaging opportunity for each of us to be heard nearly 400 guests, we want to make sure that we capture your thoughts on solutions to these challenges. So after each panel, we will vote on some of the key issues raised by that panel. To facilitate our housing solutions polling portion of our agenda today, it is a pleasure to introduce Faithia McCauley and J.R. Starrett. Thanks so much, Carl. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fathia McCauley, and I have the honor of being the Chief Lending Officer for Housing Trust Silicon Valley. And my uh, co-panel uh, leader is J.R. Starrett. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Carl and uh, SVLG, for this wonderful event and pulling us all together. Uh, I'm J.R. Starrett. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Community Engagement for the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California, MPH. Great. So we have a couple of polling questions for you, and I think they'll be coming up on the screen. So I'll go over the first one, and we'll be, it'll, you'll be answering in real time. So please go ahead and uh, vote uh, as soon as I've finished uh, reading the question. So the first poll we're asking uh, is, when compared to job and population growth, Cap California has underbuilt housing for the past 30 years. In the Bay Area, this shortage has become acute and has impacted workers and families of all incomes. What should, what should we do to address this acute impact? So the first answer, I see the answers are coming in already. Build more housing for all incomes near, locally near transit and jobs. Keep things the same. Encourage jobs and people to move outside the Bay Area and California and no opinion. And I see the answers are coming in. Uh, we have about well, a little, let's see, we have a few seconds for this uh, to continue. It looks like 10% of people have voted. It looks like the majority of people are on the thought that we should definitely build more housing. Let's see, we have a few minutes, a few seconds to go. Okay, we're almost up to 20%, everyone. Keep your, your poll, your polling coming. Great. Well, I think it's it's pretty clear. Most people believe that we should be building more housing for all incomes, locally, near transit, and jobs. A uh, few people think that we should encourage jobs and people uh, to move outside the Bay Area. Okay. About a third of us have voted. Okay, let's see. Ah, oh, I see. All right. So we'll go on to the second one. Do you support laws at the state level to streamline approval and make it easier to, I'm sorry, go ahead, JR. <laughs> sorry about that, Padilla. Um, 
And folks, just want to let you know you can scroll down and answer all three questions. They should be on your board. Uh, as Cecilia was saying, uh, uh, local housing development is often a years long bureaucratic process. Long timelines increase the cost to developers and consumers while also creating higher demand that is hard to meet. You support laws at the state level to streamline approval and make it easier to create housing development near jobs and transportation. One for yes, two for no, three for no opinion. And looks like we uh, have an overwhelming support for yes right now, but we'll continue to track that as votes coming in. Okay. And the last question, uh, local and state government often support below market rate housing with tax credits from the general fund. To increase the amount of funding dedicated to below market rate housing, which of the following funding mechanisms would you support? To eliminate or reduce the mortgage interest deduction, sales tax, real estate transfer tax, or parcel tax? Let's see, or none of the above. I, I did not see that answer. Anywhere. And it looks like we have a few more minutes left in our voting. Looks like we're up to 52% participation so far. That's excellent. Great. I think we can get it to 60. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so it looks like on question number one, the majority do believe that we should be building more housing. Okay. Looks like our polling results are in. Yes. So absolutely, 91% uh, build more housing for all incomes locally near transit and jobs, absolutely. 89% support laws at the state level to streamline the approval and make it easier to create more development near jobs and transportation. And it looks like the majority, uh, a slight majority on the last question I lean more towards the real estate transfer tax as the funding mechanism that's supported. Great. Thanks so much, Thank everyone, you for, all of for our answering. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we'll turn it back over to Carl. Hey, hey Thea and JR, thank you. It's so amazing that we can, in an innovation economy world, still have interactive dialogues on these important issues. I would note that we are right on time, but what we want to provide for each of you is a break to help relax, stretch, uh, have a bio break, grab a snack, uh, homeschool that child, whatever you need to do for the next eight minutes. We, uh, if you want to join me for a quick stretch, if you can see me, we'll just stretch up together for a moment all several hundred of us and just stretch out a little bit too and with that we're going to allow, just again allow what is now a seven minute break don't turn off your zoom connection with us because you're going to be starting again right at 11 a.m with an amazing group on education and workforce preparation hiring and equity We'll see you all in seven minutes.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our ninth annual Silicon Valley Regional Economic Forum with hundreds of participants joining us virtually today via Zoom. My name is Carl Guardino. I'm CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. We started our day with a rather robust and interactive panel with our participants, you and I in the audience, as well on housing and homelessness. We're now going to have the important conversation around education and workforce preparation and how we do that in a pre in a current COVID-19 environment, as well as a post-COVID-19 environment. We are thrilled to have each of you with us today. And we want to thank again our 24 equally branded co-hosts, as well as our incredibly generous sponsors. In a COVID-19 area, we are all seeking we are all seeking out and or leading substantive ways in which we can help our communities through this extraordinary time. At the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, in partnership with the Valley Medical Center Foundation, we are working to secure medical supplies and equipment for every public, private, and nonprofit hospital and healthcare clinic throughout Silicon Valley. On the screen, Please note the tremendous need still identified by our frontline healthcare providers throughout Silicon Valley. If you or your organization can help in any way through cash or in-kind contributions, please text me directly at 408-838-4848. Again, text me directly at 408-838-4848. In the past six weeks alone, after a modest personal contribution of $1,000, we've been blessed by Silicon Valley employers and individuals who have stepped up with 5.7 million in cash contributions and well over uh, 250,000 in in-kind donations of supplies and equipment. Uh, Again, we're making great progress, but we know in Silicon Valley, we're better together and we can even do more to ensure that our frontline healthcare professionals and the patients that they are serving are as safe as possible. See on the screen some of our generous employers and individual executives and employees from companies who are stepping forward so that we can get through our COVID-19 challenge. It is now my pleasure to introduce a longtime Valley leader and professional colleague, the Executive Director of the Silicon Valley Education Foundation. Please welcome CEO Lisa Andrew. Lisa? Thank you, Carl, and good morning, colleagues and community. It is my pleasure to open our second panel of the forum, Education and Workforce Preparation, hiring and equity. COVID-19 has challenged the education system to pivot, iterate, and create a new learning environment that now demands parent, community, and corporate partnership. While devastating, this moment does provide an opportunity to try new things, forge new relationships, and move an entire system into the 21st century. How will we capitalize on this moment to make the education system better so to meet the needs of all students? Well, today's panel represents the stakeholder groups that can influence this shift. Leading in today's educational environment is exciting to say the least. Dr. Mary Ann Duan, County Superintendent of Schools for the Santa Clara County Office of Education, is here today to provide her perspective on what education leaders are discovering through COVID-19 that will enhance the system post-pandemic and Sylvia Mahan, Vice President of Innovate Public Schools, will share some steps she's taking to advance innovation during COVID-19 to ensure students are still being educated while at home. For the students who used to roam the hallways of our, who used to roam the hallways of San Jose State, our next panelist is working to meet their needs for the balance of this calendar year. Mary Papazian, President of San Jose State University, We'll also share what lessons are being learned that will be useful in the future. Well, we are fortunate today to have a product of our local school system 
that is giving back to that same system. Sarah Garcia, Education Director for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, will share her perspective on areas of strength and opportunity for consideration as we work to serve a diverse student population. And as we know, a thriving community needs skilled trade workers. Peter O'Farrell with the Northern California Council of Carpenters is here to offer insights on how this pathway is a vital link to the economic stability for many in our community. So welcome to you all. And moderating today's discussion is Carrie Decker, Managing Director, Corporate Responsibility, J.P. Morgan Chase. Ms. Decker sits on several national and regional nonprofit boards related to workforce and education. Thank you, Ms. Decker, for moderating this distinguished panel on such an important topic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Lisa. Really excited about this panel. And thank you, panelists, uh, for joining today. So let's just dive right in. Um, Sylvia, I am going to start with you. Uh, so as we know, various schools have been closed due to shelter in place orders since mid-March and will not be returning this school year. Innovate works with some of our neediest students in underserved neighborhoods. What steps are you taking to advance innovation during COVID-19 to ensure students are still being educated while at home? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Thank you for the question. Um, and thank you to the leadership group. Thank you to Carl and all the staff at SVLG for convening us despite the distance. And to all of my fellow panelists and everyone listening, uh, I think we all agree this was an important topic before and it's exponentially uh, more important now. Um, so I have to say, I love the question that was posed to me because it presupposes that learning should be taking place right now, which I absolutely agree with. Um, at Innovate, and let me clarify, Innovate, we're not a school. Sometimes that can be confusing. We are an advocacy group. We uh, work on parent leadership, school leadership development in a pursuit of education equity. And like you said, we work with underserved families, um, Black and Latino families, low-income families, and parents of students with special needs. Um, and what we're hearing is that parents are really worried about their kids' education right now. So um, I will, as an example, uh, one parent, we work with Alicia, um, she, has, she shared with us she feels completely powerless and frustrated because her, daughter, her daughters were getting no learning for several weeks. And so she hadn't heard from the district for several weeks, and this was all made worse by the fact she has no internet um, and no, no devices um, for learning at home. Um, so you can see there are multiple layers to, to the problem before us. I think this is an important story, though, because it illustrates something um, uh, counter to a narrative that we hear often about low-income families, um, which is that they can be worried about their kids' education, and they are worried about their kids' education. They're losing jobs, they're worried about making rent, and they're really worried about their kids' education. So everything that we can do um, to provide a clear plan, clear expectations, check-ins um, from the district, access to internet and devices becomes extremely important right now. Um, so I want to call out a few bright spots that we're seeing that we can look to um, as examples um, of what, what can be working at this time. So some school districts like Alum Rock School District, Campbell Union, uh, and Eastside Union, several charter schools like Rocket Ship, um, Downtown College Prep, uh, Sunrise Middle, they all moved quickly to implement online learning. Um, they've been communicating frequently and proactively with parents. They're doing things like providing teacher office hours online and supports to students with special needs. Um, and all of those things um, are not easy and they're not smooth, right? They're, and so one of the things we're seeing is the need to just be scrappy right now and to do the best we can. Um, so it's really great to see that happening in some of our local districts. Um, but again, the digital divide is a huge hurdle. So at Innovate, we're advocating for steps at the state, city, uh, county, and school district level to close the digital divide. Um, and we're also advocating for um, districts to have clear plans and expectations. Um, we know that it's not just online learning, right? Distance learning is beyond online. It doesn't have to even be online sometimes. Um, and so having that clarity of what is it that we're doing to get our kids educated online or not, and, and having um, clear expectations for teachers and parents around mm -hmm. both online and distance learning. Um, and Thank you. Uh, I realize that I've, I've not seen the time person, so maybe. Yes, I'm, okay. I'm sorry we're about the time. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> 
all know we'd love to listen to you because it's so critical topic. I would just say to the other panelists, uh, briefly, do you have uh, anything to add, that, add to this, particularly looking from the equity lens uh, on this issue? All right. Well, let's just move along. Um, I, I'd like to uh, talk with you next, Sarah. Um, so you graduated high school from downtown college prep, an innovative public charter school. You also taught at downtown college prep. As a beneficiary of public charter education, what were the strengths of that education experience and how can it be further improved? And what steps in particular are the leadership group taking to ensure a better public education system uh, for all students? Thank you, Carrie. Well, as a San Jose native, I was blessed with the opportunity to attend great public schools. I went to Schallenberger Elementary, River Glen, and Downtown College Prep. DCP has a very special place in my heart. My classmates and I formed part of the very first graduating class. Together, we had daily lessons about resilience, tenacity, and grit. In Spanish, that's called ganas. We were a brand new school with big dreams, trying to find our place in downtown San Jose. Being located at three sites at one point, uh, we got to know the area pretty well. For some of us, our walks through San Jose State University uh, during passing periods were daily reminders to keep our eyes on the prize. ECP's mission is to have their students be the first in their families to attend university. Fast forward a few years, I went to Santa Clara University, graduated, and after a brief stint at Google, I had the honor to give back to the place that afforded me with so many opportunities. Uh, public charter schools are in a unique position to provide their students with innovative approaches to learning and the student experience alike. Just like any other public school, they are legally obligated by, to state standards to meet them, but there's a lot of freedom when it comes to curriculum development and practices. For instance, some charter schools follow the Waldorf model. Others focus on STEM, STEAM, blended learning, the arts, bilingual education, even agronomy. Uh, so this freedom, however, does make it difficult to put charter schools in one box, and that merits annual reviews as well as five-year renewal audits. In 1992, a group of public school teachers, parents, and community members helped pass the Charter School Law of California, and its purpose was to develop incubators of innovation that would allow for an exchange of ideas and best practices that could then be shared across all public schools. It would be amazing if we could have, if we could see a more intentional effort on behalf of both traditional public schools and charter schools alike to have that exchange and help us ensure that good ideas don't stay in one place. Uh, while the topic of charter schools may be polarizing, there's one thing we can all agree on and that's that we need to pay our teachers more so that they can live in the communities in which they serve. For those of you with children at home right now, I bet you, you're reminded on a daily basis of, the, of how essential, vital, and priceless our teachers are for both your students and your sanity. Um, Christoph, I see Thank that. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanna share a little bit about what, uh, what the leadership group is doing here. Uh, so we, we support quality schools. We are here to support the success of all students in our community, regardless of their zip code, family income, or which schools they attend. Uh, and the education and workforce development team focuses on diversifying the STEM pipeline, ensuring that our future workforce is reflective of our beautiful community. Our legislative efforts and programmatic efforts really demonstrate that. Our Young Women's and Young Men's Leadership Summits welcome historically underserved students at public, charter, public, and private schools alike. And the first season of our San Jose Student Inspiration Series has provided tickets to close to 1,000 high school students at 15 schools across the city. With your support, we hope to continue these efforts and appreciate the opportunity to serve alongside you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to say uh, on behalf of all of us also, thank you for being such a role model and such an inspiration. And we're, we're all very lucky to have you uh, at the leadership group. So, so thank you, Sarah. Um, thank I'd you. like to move now uh, to S Superintendent Dewan. Uh, you not only work hand in glove with 32 other school districts in Santa Clara County, but also instruct some of our region's most neediest students. What lessons are you learning specifically through COVID-19 that you want to amplify and that will better serve our students and teachers when we return, hopefully, to a semblance of uh, normalcy? So, Superintendent? 
Good morning. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, thank you, Carl, and to all of our friends at the leadership group and to all of the elected officials who are working so hard during this time as well. So COVID-19 has really brought the county closer together, operating as a countywide community. We're reminded daily that the value of our schools goes far beyond academics. Um, learning and educational outcomes, social, emotional, and physical wellness, and access to food, counseling services, and more are all top of mind for many families today. Many children and families are experiencing some level of isolation, varying levels of success, and some frustrations. And we are reminded each and every day that learning is social. Technology is a powerful tool that has enabled us to deliver education and other services. Dependence on technology has also increased our awareness of the barriers that limit access and are causing inequities and exclusion. We've solved some of the problems underlying these barriers, and yet there are many more to solve, and it's going to require the best of all of us. But we must sustain what we've done so far and continue with blended learning that incorporates online learning platforms along with in-person instruction. And I urge all of us to reimagine the role of internet access. The internet is absolutely essential for learning and access to a whole host of services, including education. How do we make it core? As core as electricity or garbage collection. Some form of distance learning will inevitably be a component of schooling now, even when we return to campus. Distance learning plans will need to be a skillfully constructed combination of educational, engaging, and social and emotional development learning opportunities. And having multiple options and plans to accommodate learning in new and innovative ways will be a part of our schooling experience. Plans to address social and emotional needs of students, family, and staff will need to be a part of our return to physical campus. And we need to amplify what it takes to address barriers and make the sustained investments necessary to reduce the disparities and the inequities facing our community. Thank you so much, Superintendent. I would ask the other panelists on this uh, particular topic of any other lessons learned uh, that you would like to call out that are really uh, top of mind for us as we, as we head back to the other side. Yes, uh, Sylvia. Um, Dr. Juwan, thank you for that. I think those are all just such important points. Um, I, I think another piece that, that comes to mind is the way that parents have taken this role as, uh, in some cases, primary educators for their kids right now. Mm -hmm. and, and it's always been true that that's an important role and that their relationship between teachers and, teachers and parents is essential. And I'm thinking that this is an opportunity for us mm -hmm. um, to really strengthen and support that relationship. And, and there's sort of all new ways to do it right now. So it's, I think, an exciting time. To build, um, to build on that. That's an excellent point, that parental involvement. Thank you. Uh, any, any others? Uh, yeah, if, if I might, just for a moment. I, I really work on the, on the more senior end of this, but I was talking to some, um, some parents and uh, early childhood development um, experts and thinking about the, the uh, front end, the, the, uh, the preschool, the kindergarten, the, the early elementary grades as well. And the, um, the move from a very structured environment to one that's a little more free flowing and what that does potentially to promote creativity. Um, one of the things we know and we'll talk a little bit more about um, in this panel is when we emerge from this and we think about the kind of digital environment um, uh, in which our economy has been moving, um, it is going to require more of that creativity. And there have been some complaints that we've overly structured some things. So there may be, and I'd be interested in your perspective, there may be some, um, some benefits that, were, that we wouldn't have anticipated, that it's just forcing us to rethink um, some of the habits and ask, are they really producing the kind of learning environment that is productive um, at all ages? Well, we certainly you. heard from families um, a lot about that, those things, just how to have a schedule and a routine at home. And they have certainly found a lot of benefits to having a routine that incorporates play, physical activity throughout the day, uh, time for unstructured learning, mm -hmm. and a lot of opportunity to design some of their own assignments and work products. Mm -hmm. um, and families have uh, really also reported just how much they value their teachers. For sure. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, um, I, I'd actually like to go back to you, uh, President Papazian, and talk a bit more about on the university side uh, in COVID-19. Um, as the oldest four-year public university, uh, how is San Jose State meeting students' needs for the balance of this calendar year and for however longer, I guess. <laughs> uh, and, and again, you know, really thinking about lessons learned from this experience that could be transferable. Uh, to the future. So, uh, President Papazian? Well, well, thank you. And again, thanks to Carl, to the leadership group, and to uh, everyone who's joined us on this call. Um, this couldn't be more important. Uh, certainly, universities are facing a great deal of stress, uh, just as education is up and down the line. And uh, frankly, there will be many across the country that don't make it. Um, but we've been around for over 160 years, and so we know we're going to still be around. The question is, how are we going to meet this moment? How are we going to meet the needs of our students? And how are we going to set ourselves and them uh, up for success as we emerge from it? And I want to go back to the, the point that Marianne made. I think it's a critical one. Internet access has to be treated as a, um, a utility for the entire community. We are seeing now that those disparities are really um, at all levels, and we're feeling it um, at the university, are um, hurting some of our students as they move to a digital environment. So we, you know, we've seen some real um, action on the part of some of the uh, those companies making internet access free. We've been sending MiFi's, um, loaner computers uh, for checkout, all kinds of things to ensure that students do have the resources they need and recognizing that not all of them do. Um, we moved to an online environment in, in three days and it was a massive undertaking. Um, faculty uh, had to really rethink how they were teaching their courses. Uh, we had to think about the technology that we'd been investing in and how was that going to support the added usage. Um, and so many of the lessons learned coming out of it are really what was successful in this process, where were the gaps, where were we really challenged, and how can we ensure that we're putting the resources and the expertise in the place they need to be for a learning environment that will lead to the work environment of the future. I will say that um, many of the moves in the economy were already there, and many folks mm -hmm. on this call know that already. Um, we were moving to a, a digital economy. I mean, we're here in Silicon Valley, we see it every day, but many still wanted to pretend it wasn't happening. And I think what this is forcing us to do is to confront it, to address it, to recognize the importance of actual in-person social relationships, not just in learning, but in growing, and to find the right balance between the two. Um, just on a, on a practical level, you know, we're, we're going to be investing a great deal in instructional design and in introducing new technologies, um, new ways of approaching uh, learning outcomes as fully as we can. And I'm going to end with one very small story. Our um, engineering students, very innovative, came up with very thoughtful ways to manipulate labs from a distance. Um, so lots to talk about on what we've learned and uh, what we can build on going forward. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, President Papazian. Um, I'd like to segue a little to uh, focus in on the workforce training uh, component and I'd like to go to you, uh, Peter. Uh, you serve 35,000 union professionals in our building trades with the nationally recognized apprentice and training program. Um, can you talk a bit about the depth and breadth of the program? and how we can guide more students to career pathways uh, in construction trades, especially uh, at this time of uh, economic turmoil and looking towards uh, our recovery. So, Peter? And you're on mute. <laughs> there okay. you go. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, audience. Uh, let me tell you a quick, you know, brief story of the, of us, the uh, Carpenters Training Fund. So back in 1961, the Carpenters Union signatory contractors formed a joint apprenticeship training committee, which they funded by every hour worked on the job. So now to present, you know, now we, we are serving 6,200 apprentices and yeah, approximately 35,000 journey level workers in Northern California. So we run apprenticeship 
uh, classes weekly during normal business hours. We run about 35 classes a week, 16 students in each class for 36 hours. And these are mandatory classes. And then in the evenings and weekends, we run the journey level advancement classes. So, you know, and we run about five of those a week with five to 10 members in, you know, the, the people are at work and then they're coming to training. So they're very committed in uh, the Carpenters Union to that. So um, we cover 10 different trades of so carpentry, acoustical installers, scaffold erectors, office modular installers, insulators, hardwood floor layers, shinglers, millwork and cabinet makers, mill rights, power drivers, including underwater welding. So, yeah, and we partner with our uh, Carpenters International Training Fund. They're located in Vegas. So all across America, the, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters are trained the same way, including Canada. Uh, in Northern California, we uh, partner with uh, many organizations, community-based organizations, women's organizations, veterans organizations, to assist in the opportunity for people to, in underserved communities, women, veterans, to find you know, well-paid, exciting careers. So our, pro our program, we have a numerical referral system, which we also run our six-week pre-apprenticeship program for people who have no experience in the construction industry and are looking for a well-paid career that's uh, fulfilling. So, and being an essential business, I feel right now is a great opportunity for people to think about construction. We are an essential business, training the trades, we have suspended training though, just so we can create a program where our staff and the students are safe from spreading viruses and stuff. And so we're, we're getting about ready to reopen because we have created a plan where, you know, they would come in for a bit, we would give them an I, iPad, they would take it home, do their courses at home in a safer environment, and then come back and do their physical training, which we've created a, a training area that they could do their six foot spacing. And, and uh, use their own tools. So uh, yeah, we're walking in this COVID time trying to make it a better program and assist the signatory contractors who need the workers out there performing, building this housing that they were talking about on the earlier panel. Well, Peter, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the work that you do for, for this region. It's more critical than ever. So we appreciate it. And um, I, I guess it's time to uh, actually turn to questions. I know there are a lot of questions folks would like to ask. So I'd like to first start with question one. Uh, this comes from Eden Housing CEO, Linda Mandolini, uh, who we all know and love. Um, her question is, COVID-19 has revealed the significant digital divide regarding education access. How might we get more affordable in-home broadband access and devices to low-income children. How might we partner with affordable housing providers to expand access? Thanks, I'm spending a lot of time worrying about this right now. So, panelists, thoughts? Sylvia. Uh yeah, I can just share uh, just a few things. I, the affordable housing, great question. I don't know the answer on that, but there are a few things happening that are of interest. Um, I know the mayor has a digital inclusion fund. So this was pre-COVID, working to really expand internet in the city of San Jose. Um, and uh, Eastside Union actually had a very innovative partnership with the city where they were able to get um, internet to 6,000 households uh, in their district. And so those are the kinds of things that I think we want to see more of is those partnerships, public, uh, partnerships and in fact with and with private sector dollars. Thank you. It looked like Dr. Dewan you wanted to add something. Yes. Yes, I would like to. So the digital inclusion partnership with the city of San Jose um, has been recently expanded to, to really think about the whole county and refocusing some of that effort um, to include more access in support of uh, distance learning. I, I also really believe there's a need to look at infrastructure investments and not to place the burden of infrastructure on individual schools and school districts, um, but really to think um, more broadly about uh, where the gaps in the system are and how, how to put some things in place in the infrastructure. And I love the possibility that affordable housing could be a place where just like a local Starbucks or a, you know a, another place in the community where internet is provided broadly could be 
also in these affordable housing uh, communities and develop developments and to think about invest making those investments as we're developing those plans i think could be a really powerful support Harry, if I could just jump in as well, yeah, just a brief please. comment. I, I think this is exactly um, uh, right. And, and the reality is this divide was there all along. And if, if what comes out of this is an, a commitment and a strategy to actually close that, that will have a, a real impact on um, closing the achievement gap and the opportunity gap as well. And the preparation of students going from K through 12 and coming to the university. So I, I really think we've got to put that front and center. Um, that will be part of the tools we need to really kind of push forward with a real inclusive agenda. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I guess uh, I'm sure we could talk about this topic <laughs> for quite a while, but I do want to get other questions in uh, from our audience. Uh, the next question is from Jeff Schmidt, who uh, says, first of all, really a fantastic lineup. So thank you, panel, for, for that. A uh, quick question for Dr. Dewan and Dr. Papazian. On a previous call, Dr. Dewan mentioned she was raised in the Midwest and they're a bit more prepared for distance learning due to snow days. Uh, she expected this would need to become part of our new ways of delivering student services. And she just mentioned it, and you, I should say, just mentioned it again as well. But each teacher is delivering lessons very differently now. How do they see the standardization with teachers starting to happen quickly so that we're more uh, ready next time? So both Dr. Dewan and then uh, uh, President Papazian. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the question. Uh, so I think that the uh, description of how we might be able to pivot to an e-learning day or a series of days um, is really what we're talking about in terms of blended learning. And if we are making these investments in our learning platforms, um, ensuring that all of our teachers are trained in how to do um, quality online lessons, so that um, there, it's not something that we're retooling overnight, that is just a part of the way we design our curriculum and our instructional delivery. So um, any day of the week could become an e-learning day if necessary, or if we find that due to the pandemic, we may need to close again for any period of time, that we're already in that position where the structure of the uh, instructional program is in place and can be uh, shifted to another type of platform. And, and I would add that um, uh, what we're doing now, there, there are always differences in the way a, a faculty member, a professor will, um, will manage or design a course, but we're gonna be investing significantly over the summer in an institute, um, it's, it's voluntary, but we expect many of our faculty will actually participate in it that introduces them and works with them on various models of instructional design, various kinds of flipped classrooms, hybrid models, uh, fully online, synchronous, asynchronous, um, and becomes, creates a, a comfort with uh, first the technologies that are available so that they can choose something that meets the needs of what they want to accomplish in the classroom. But it's going to take that kind of an investment. We've always had faculty who have done it. We have some classes, uh, some programs that are, have been fully online for a long time, mm -hmm. but this will be a, an actual um, full university effort to provide the support to faculty so they can provide the support to students. And, um, and that's really, really the key and give them as much flexibility and options to meet the learning outcomes that they've set up and, and uh, the approach they'd like to take for their class. Now, I would just add to that the uh, county office through our professional learning and instructional support division is providing uh, hundreds of courses to help teachers earn a badge mm -hmm. in those best practices of online mm -hmm. learning, becoming uh, familiar with the appropriate platforms mm -hmm. given the different ages and stages of a young person. Not every platform or every device mm -hmm. or every instructional uh, program is appropriate uh, for all students and K-12 is quite a range. So that investment in um, the teacher training is really important. And then I think the second piece is the supports that we're providing to parents to help them understand uh, ways mm -hmm. to support their children at home, um, including through our warm line, which is an online call center where parents can call and get help with distance learning and supporting teens at home, but also um, through the digital inclusion uh, partnership ways that families are 
getting connected and being able to stay connected so that if we ever need to make this shift back and forth more fluidly uh, to distance learning, uh, our families are prepared. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to move on to another question uh, coming in from Hospital Council CEO, Joe Cafaro, uh, wondering, and going back to you, sorry, Dr. Dewan, um, if uh, you can explain, this is obviously a very important question, what we should expect for the next school year. Will it start in July, as mentioned by the governor? Uh, will it be a combination of online uh, and face-to-face? Uh, -face? Tell us what you know. Well, we um, are we're not currently um, funded or have a mechanism to uh, reopen in July. And also we don't have data locally to suggest that we've reached the, the right stage um, of the, our pandemic response that could allow us to, to open. Um, so I, I can't say that we would open in July. I don't believe that um, that is very likely. Um, we are encouraging and working very closely with public health to think about um, options for how we would reopen. And it's very important that if our data allows us to have physical uh, campus reopening, that we're ready to do that. Um, and I think it's going to look a lot different. I think we're going to have um, considerations for ways to do health checks, um, how to work with smaller groups of students, um, modifying some of the ways that we clean um, our, our facilities, and the types of access to training uh, for our teachers and all personnel to make a, a big focus on the health and safety. That is going to be essential to being allowed to operate and to keep our physical campuses open. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so a new question has come in from uh, ALF CEO, Suzanne St. John Crane. Um, and she asks, as a parent with a child in a San Jose public school, I was surprised to hear that my school district was able to get their online learning structure up fairly fast. And the school districts next door did not have curricula for weeks, if at all. Uh, what's the plan for getting, I think part of this has been addressed, but what's the plan for getting equitable education offerings delivered across public school districts in our county? And is cross-sector support needed uh, to, to get this done? And I don't know if you'd like to take that, if maybe Sylvia has any thoughts on cross-sector support. Um, Others. It's really a question for Dr. Duan, right? Because I don't, I don't <laughs> know what the is. Um, I, I obviously think that this is something to address. So yeah, I, I think yeah. I appreciate okay. <laughs> I, um, So I think it, it is going to require cross-sector support. Um, you know, I think schools and school districts are well positioned to solve at some levels um, of the problem to, you know, to get to equity. But I think every single district has its own uh, different context, its different funding mechanisms, um, and, and also just access to resources. So really thinking about the, the problem countywide has allowed us to identify some of the common barriers that we know could be addressed with cross-sector investment and participation. Um, one we've mentioned several times already today was it's just access to the internet and then access to internet that is uh, robust and has the strength to really support the types of online instruction that teachers would like to be able to do. Um, I think additionally, um, we're really fortunate that as all of us as a state are working on this problem together. And so there's also a lot of statewide recognition for the needed investment in teacher training, uh, access to devices, and trying to standardize the types of learning platforms that will allow for safe and secure learning um, to, you know, that is device agnostic. Thank you so much. And I'm being told that uh, it's time. Uh, that was our last question. Uh, so I wanted to uh, thank all of you, our panelists, for this critical conversation. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic and uh, look forward to continuing uh, this really important dialogue in the weeks and, and months ahead. So thank you. Turning it back to you, Carl. I, th I think we have just a little more time as there oh. is a question that uh, great well 
Good. I see yeah. one more question. Has Can I just in. make one comment? Carry on yeah. the last question really quick, yeah. really quick. I would just say that um, uh, one area of support for some of these districts is our College of Education, the Lurie College of Education, which um, prepares so many of the teachers and works closely out in, um, in all the districts and actually has started an institute on the future of learning. So really thinking about how the new technologies can support um, the, the, uh, the real learning uh, directions mm -hmm. that, that we're seeing more broadly. Just wanted to put that out there as a plug. Well, thank you. And just as I said, uh, our last question, we, we did have another question come in that I really think is absolutely critical uh, for, for all of us. Um, and so I will, I will read it. Um, it's how are school districts addressing distance learning for special needs kids, many of whom have speech, occupational, and physical therapies built into their IEPs? Uh, this is from Peggy Lee. Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. So a very important question. It is a very important question and I'm absolutely delighted that it's being asked. I think the needs of our students with disabilities are so significant and even more so now uh, during this time because not only does the student but often the parents uh, depend upon the personnel in our special education departments uh, to support their students. So um, this has been a, a huge challenge. And some of the ways that we're addressing it is to provide um, opportunities for scheduling throughout the day and utilizing teleservices to provide um, guidance and support and online um, services to students with disabilities. Students with disabilities have a wide range um, of needs and services. And so it is necessarily individualized and we also know that some of the services that um, the student needs don't translate very easily to an online platform. And so we um, are recognizing that um, additional supports to the parents during this time has been really critical to meeting the needs of students. And we are really anxious and look forward to the time when we can provide more of the in-person support to the students um, who are really suffering right now. Thank you so much. Uh, any any other panelists like to add to that? I think that's. Um, I think Sylvia. I, yeah, just to, just a, uh, maybe it's a question actually. Um, um, we've heard from some schools, um, and I know that some districts have done such a, a huge job on this. I've been so impressed with like Alum Rock is, we have parents that are like, yeah, this is great. We're so happy we, our students with special needs are getting all their services. Um, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about, um, I know there are providers and I guess Dr. Dewan, I don't know if you can comment on the cost because I know it can be expensive, mm -hmm. but I've heard from providers that they're actually able to meet almost the full spectrum of need online, but I'm conscious that it's expensive. So I'm, I'm curious if you can comment a little bit on that. Well, I think that it's true that providers and even our own personnel can provide a great um, number of the services, but there are services that do not transfer um, to an online platform. And that reality, um, you know, is something that systemically we're working through and trying to identify what are some of the safe ways that when we're able, uh, when we're permitted, that we'll be able to uh, get back in touch with this in-person service delivery. And those are the kinds of things that we might do even before um, school campuses are able to fully reopen. We may be providing for some compensatory services or finding some other ways to get to our students to help bridge the gap a bit um, before uh, we return to school. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, that was a great note to end on. and. Uh, really, again, thank our panelists. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you for your leadership. Uh, we are behind you 110%, uh, and I'll turn it uh, over to our, our, our closers. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Neil Collins, and I'm the CEO of the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. Uh, first off, I want to thank the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and all of today's panelists for giving their time and perspective uh, some of my key takeaways are the digital divide is, is real. It's negatively affecting many of our families and our communities, especially while our schools are in this shutdown mode. Internet access has to be considered a utility. 
Schools are more than just a place of learning. Schools provide meals, they provide social well-being, they provide structure. Blended and distance learning will continue to be part of the education system going forward. The key is how we can provide a structured learning environment while incorporating digital access to education. The Carpenters Trade Union is doing some tremendous work in giving students and people of all ages upward economic mobility in a time where we need the trades more than ever. And as a parent, I just wanna take a moment to, to share my profound respect for everything that the educators are doing, uh, not only during this time, but, but what they're doing for our children uh, during our normal times as well. I have a profound respect for the education system. And lastly, I just wanna thank you for allowing us to participate today. Stay safe and be well. Neil Collins, thank you. It's always such a pleasure to partner with you and the Realtors Association. Again, this is Carl Guardino with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and we intentionally make our Silicon Valley Regional Economic Forums as interactive as possible, not only getting to as many of your excellent questions as we can, but also by polling after each topic is addressed so that we have an even better sense of your views on these important issues. We're very fortunate today to have a key education leader in our valley, the Vice President of Innovation for the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, Rosemary Kamei, who will walk us through our panel questions and polling. Rosemary? Great, Carl. Thank you so much. It was a great panel and discussion. Um, the first question that we have up is uh, to ensure Silicon Valley colleges can continue to develop talent trained for innovation economy. Our company would be very interested to be able to, and the uh, responses are one, provide virtual training for students, uh, two, uh, speak in virtual classrooms to expose students to STEM careers, three, host virtual internships, and four, all of the above. Pick your choices now. Okay, as those come in, we're going to move quickly to the next question. Uh, question number two is uh, equity is central to the leadership group mission. What do you view as the best way to ensure that all students have access to high quality education during the COVID-19 pandemic? What an appropriate question. Uh, and the uh, choices for the poll are, number one, focusing on providing students hardware that would include laptop, hotspots, and broadband access. Uh, number two, uh, private sector funding directed at local schools, helping our schools. Uh, and number three, parent education around online platforms so that they can better support their students during this crisis. And we will have the, uh, your poll come in and uh, give you a minute there. And then the final question that you can see on your screen as you're moving along is question number three. The current crisis highlights longstanding gaps in access to technology. For instance, 20% of California students or 1.2 million cannot access the internet at home. What is the best way to ensure that immediate necessary responses turn into long-term commitments? Uh, and the choices on the poll are, number one, statewide policy advocacy to allocate ongoing funding for schools' technological needs. 
Number two, district-wide investments in local public schools technology needs through local bond measures. Uh, number three, company school partnerships. Adopt the school, provide sponsorships. Number four, boost existing public and nonprofit programs currently working with students and families on the wrong side of the digital divide. So those are your choices on the poll and we will take a moment to have those come on in. And there we have it. Uh, the first question, it looks like all of the above. We have 60% there. Uh, on the second question on equity, uh, we have focusing on providing students hardware, laptops, hotspots, hot and broadband access uh, at 63%. And uh, the last question of the poll on the current crisis and highlights, uh, it looks like 51% uh, of you believe that statewide policy advocate, advocacy to allocate ongoing funding for schools' technological needs. And there you have it. Uh, great uh, responses, and I will turn it over to Carl now. Rosemary Kamei, thanks for leading us through our interactive poll and for your leadership throughout our region for so many years. We Thank you so much. Thank you. We, um, if we could come back to me instead of the screen for a moment, I want to communicate again that we've had so much food for thought. Now it's time for some food to eat. We're going to take our lunch break, stretch, walk around, return to those calls and texts, and we will start again promptly at 12.30 p.m. with our resilient communities in a COVID-19 world panel, which includes County Board President Cindy Chavez, who has been leading so effectively during our COVID-19 challenge, and Governor, Governor Newsom, Secretary of Natural Resources, Wade Crowfoot, who has been integral to the governor's work and the administration during the COVID-19 challenge. You're going to want to stay on the line and or reconnect on the line at 1230. Enjoy your break. We'll start again with our resilient communities in an unstable climate panel at 1230. Thank you all. which um, would be critical to the future success and growth of Caltrain. Caltrain today uh, is the uh, seventh largest commuter rail in the, in the country and moves 65,000 people, but we've come up with this service vision that could triple that ridership. Uh, but that can't happen without a, a dedicated source of revenue. So despite uh, the crisis, we are continuing to work with all our partners and boards of supervisors in our three counties uh, to keep this possibility open. Uh, we know it's a, a long shot, but um, uh, it, it's one we do want to keep the door open uh, for. And with many of the, uh, of the initiatives we had underway, um, you know, we can't take our eye off the ball. Uh, it's hard to predict uh, at what rate we will um, you know, re return to uh, a climate where going to the ballot uh, could be a possibility. Great, thank you. Deborah and then Nick, please. Hey, thank you, Allison. 
Um, one thing I want to mention about at BTA, where we're really a multimodal agency, is that we really look at how to provide transit multimodal options through an equity lens. So how are we, and one of the things we're seeing during the current pandemic is how important it is to move essential workers as well as those in, a, in communities of concern. So as we move forward, and I agree with the previous speakers, these regional initiatives are very important um, and, and bring us a lot of regional mobility, super regional mobility, but we also can't forget um, our local mobility. 80% of the travelers in Santa Clara County live and work within the county. So we also need to keep thinking about funding that supports those um, shorter trips, which usually are more focused on our communities of concern, especially in a situation where our longer trips may be more of our white collar workers that are going to have the options to telecommute. Um, and then thinking about federal funding, which I, I think is so important. I'm, I'm really heartened to hear um, more conversation about the federal government looking at infrastructure spending that creates jobs, improves transit access, reduces traffic congestion. Um, but I think one of the things the current pandemic has shown us is the fragility of transit operations being so dependent on sales tax revenues, um, which it is 80% at BTA. Um, we really want to have transit operations from the federal government to be an ongoing priority and would also make the sales tax funding source, um, I mean, make it less regressive that we're focused on sales tax for funding. Thank you. Last but not least, Nick. Um, it's always, it's always good being the last person to answer the question when six really smart people have gone before you, um, and said everything that should be said, but, um, you know, it's, it's really important that we, um, can, that we think boldly about our future, even in times like this. And, um, you know, the, the, the statewide resilience bond, um, the Caltrain measure, um, the affordable housing, the $10 billion affordable housing bond, um, in the Bay Area, Baja, um, are all just sort of critical, bold moves that we need to continue working on because I think there's a lot of hope that we'll be in a position um, where um, we might be able to move them this year. And if not, we need to continue working on them. But I think we also need to be conscious that we can't just keep on working on the same measures um, that we were working on two months ago. Um, I think we need to be reorienting those measures to focus on jobs um, and economic recovery. Um, and I think the way to do that um, is to uh, make sure that we're not, these measures aren't putting a sort of small down payment down on projects that are gonna be built in 20 years, um, or that they're not um, funding um, exclusively large projects, mega projects um, with a huge amount of delivery risk. Um, but if we can if we can put our money towards funding, you know, hundreds or thousands of smaller projects um, which don't have a significant amount of delivery risk, which can put people to work tomorrow, um, I think we're going to see a huge a, a real that resonate a lot more with with voters and be much more responsive um, to the moment. Um, and there'll be a time to go back and work on those larger projects later. Um, I think we also need to acknowledge. Um, that even those smaller projects, um, even if we're going to be doing um, thousands of resilience projects and thousands of complete streets projects, um, we're going to need to find ways to get those projects out the door faster that go hand in hand with those revenue, with these revenue mechanisms. Um, should we really require um, pedestrian safety and bike safety projects or transit facility upgrades to go through CEQA at a moment like this? Um, and, uh, and, I, I think that's a case that, that, that we need to kind of look at those two things together. And then finally, I think we need to really make sure that we're focusing these revenue bonds where they're delivering really badly needed infrastructure that's delivering on resilience, climate, public health jobs, um, as, as Supervisor Chavez said, um, on, on projects that are gonna relieve government budgets. Um, because if we build big infrastructure projects, they're gonna take a lot of money to operate. Um, they're gonna to have to take that operating money from other projects that already exist, other services that already exist, because there's not much more money out there. If we can deliver projects on existing systems, um, which can upgrade those systems, make them work more efficiently and reduce the cost to operate them, um, I think that's where you're seeing, um, that, that seems to me like a much more sustainable approach for these types of measures. Um, and, and it's gonna sort of set them up to be most responsive to the moment. Great. 
I was frantically taking notes, hoping to highlight things, but I feel like every response was a highlight. So I'm going to trust our closer to artfully um, choose um, some of the highlights. But I really like what I'm hearing around win-win-win situations, um, efficiency, local mobility, love all that stuff. I could go on, but I should go on. Um, does anyone have anything burning left to uh, add to that question among our panelists? Okay, hearing that, I'll move on to the second question. Thank you all for those responses. Uh, do you see ways that the federal, and this was brought up, federal economic stimulus and state economic recovery bills can be structured to build equitable climate resilience at the local and regional level? So some of you have touched on, on this and additional detail would be great there. Second part of the question, how uh, should our region intentionally shape then where and how we develop as a result of, of this stimulus effort so that economic recovery improves resilience for all communities, especially communities of concern. Uh, I won't go in any particular order. I'll go with whoever wants to jump in on that question first. Or I'll start calling them. I'd be uh, happy to uh, begin. Um, prior to uh, COVID, there was some great work being done on the climate resiliency bond for the state of California. And, you know, we're hearing from assembly leaders that they want to repackage that uh, into a broader infrastructure bill, but retain those cli climate resiliency goals. And then on the federal level, you know, we've been waiting forever for a big infrastructure uh, stimulus. And maybe we'll see one this time. Uh, a crisis makes people act. So uh, I have confidence that we will see substantial new funding opportunities. And one where uh, those monies would uh, be put, put to good use is in our continued effort to restore San Francisco Bay. Uh, I chair the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, and we have ambitious plans to uh, restore an additional 15,000 acres of, of the tidal wetlands, which is critical to the ecosystem and uh, for providing flood protection and protection against sea level rise. So these projects, they're ready to go. Um, we have an expedited permitting system we've put in place. And there's more urgency than people appreciate because if you don't get the restoration going, uh, you know, in the next decade, the opportunity will be lost because uh, former salt ponds and such will be, will be flooded. So, uh, it's uh, an example of how uh, uh, big infrastructure uh, funding uh, can help produce jobs and provide long-term protections and ecosystem benefits uh, for the region. Yeah, and I would, this is Wade, I would just concur with Dave um, that I think there's real strong state leadership on infrastructure investment that is focused around climate resilience. Uh, it was the uh, leaders in the Assembly and Senate that actually initiated a climate resilience bond last year. Um, as you noted, the governor uh, expressed his commitment to that bond back in January before COVID. And then very recently, yesterday maybe, Assembly leaders uh, talked about really reshaping this um, and ensuring that the investments build resilience, but in ways that really stimulate the economy. So for example, really, um, highlighting or focusing on those resilience investments that create jobs and move uh, funding into uh, local communities. Uh, obviously, different types of investments have different um, economic stimulus benefits. And so I think the focus now is, um, you know, uh, as the assembly noted is, can there be a consensus around a stimulus package that again really does meet that kind of duo goal of building our resilience, but then also really um, stimulating our economy as it recovers. Critically important. I think this week uh, our state uh, unemployment, or I should say economic development department issued over a billion dollars of unemployment uh, benefits each day. Um, so I think we can't underestimate just the, the economic impact of COVID on our economy and the fact that any stimulus, whether it's a bond or any other spending, really has to focus on how do we uh, uh, sort of prime the pump for getting our economy um, back on, on, on track. I think th the Bay Area is really well positioned uh, to make the case or prioritize investments that build 
equity and resilience. Um, you know, I'll observe having come, spent you know a lot of my time uh, over the last 20 years and career in the Bay Area. There is some really so, sort of cohesive leadership, particularly around environmental resilience in the Bay. Um, really impressed with the work of the Restoration Authority, um, the the work of sea level rise planning, and I think I, my recommendation to Bay Area leaders is really you know sort of get your house in order as it relates to regional priorities so that whether it's federal stimulus or state stimulus, um, you as a region are really helping shape the investments in that region uh, versus uh, reacting to uh, what gets proposed. And I think, I think the Bay Area is very much up to it based on you know, the leadership obviously of SBLG and, and many on the, on the, uh, in the conference here today. Allison, I'd like to talk a little bit about the second part of the question, which is how we can shape development to address resilience in communities of concern. Um, and it really struck me when one of our speakers this morning, you know, really warned us in this pandemic time not to overreact and think we need to move away from denser development in our city cores. And really want to encourage as we move forward with our policies, are we really focusing on policies on more development in city cores around transit hub? Um, along transit corridors. We've done a lot of work in Santa Clara County to develop a frequent transit network. And if we can focus our, our development there, it'll result, result in less auto travel, as well as more transit, bike, walk. Um, the other advantage of this is this really allows the potential for more open space and buffer areas. So as we face issues like increasing sea level rise, we really need to move the development back towards our, our city cores, towards our transit, um, and away from the, the edge of the bay. Um, and it's just these safe and efficient multimodal options um, really allows us to address the opportunities for our communities of concern. Um, and, it, and it makes me think when I think about all the open space that's gone away in the county, I mean, I do miss the orange and cherry orchards of my childhood in San Jose. So would love to see us redevelop some of that. Nick, I, I'll, I'll uh, jump in. I, I was waiting for you, but I, so I think that we have a really interesting opportunity at a local level. And I just want to reinforce what Wade said, is that through the leadership group, you've all seen the, the slides pop up that says all the things we've accomplished. We put our heads together. I have to say, having um, the business community uh, come together in such a strong way to protect the broader community has been just an amazing experience. What I think is, is that we, we have to create uh, um, non-traditional ways of thinking and acting that are a little bit of a throwback. So let me just give you an example. What Nick talked about was these small uh, local uh, opportunities, some of them large, but local opportunities to be able to spend a tax dollar or a private dollar more than one way. Giving someone a good paying job, protecting the environment, and um, and and you know, stimulating the economy and um, protecting an asset. So as an example of that, if you look back when we had the Great Depression and the president then did the WPA, you can see that the work of all of that all over this country. You see it in parks, you see it with the preservation of historic buildings. They even spent money to pay artists to take pictures of what was happening and to write about what was happening. And I think we have to be able to understand that we're going to have a bunch of people out of work for an extended period of time that are going to need to be retrained to do something else. And if and we don't have time, we you know, their families can't wait for food or health insurance or all those things. So I think this is an opportunity for us to be just bullish and as disciplined and as swift as we can move together to get investments here that really do change lives and protect the environment. Like, I think it's possible to do all of that. Um, uh, Cindy, I've never known you to wait, Supervisor Chavez, I've never known you to wait for anybody, but I appreciate you waiting, <laughs> waiting for me. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I think that we, um, um, I think that the, I, 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 I'm, I'm really encouraged to hear um, Secretary Crowfoot sort of from his perspective, talk about how the work that the Bay Area has done on resiliency puts us in a great place, because that also feels, that feels very true, that ultimately um, we, we, we're not gonna have people, it, it's not gonna work to have people tell us which projects to do. It's really gonna rely on, on the kind of the incredible local work that's been done in San Jose and in Santa Clara um, and, and around the Bay 
um, to sort of have these projects which are ready to go um, and, uh, and which are just waiting for us to move forward. Um, and, and I think this is a moment, as, as Supervisor Chavez said, like there are, there are so many people who um, we, we can take this opportunity to transition them into, um, into, uh, into the industries of the future. Um, that we don't have enough people in our region who are trained at wetland conservation um, and wetland creation. Um, and yet that's something that we know we're going to have to get really good at um, and we're going to have to have a huge amount of skill in um, if we're going to be able to, to save our communities from the worst impacts of climate change. Um, and, uh, and similarly around sort of building out smart grids um, and, uh, and deploying um, sort of the electric vehicle charging infrastructure that we need. We don't have enough people, we don't have enough electricians um, in this region um, who, can, who, who can allow us to move at the scale that we need to. Um, so so being, seeing this as, as the time when we really make that workforce transition in a high road um, framework is, uh, is, 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 is I think how we can really shift our economy. And we kind of missed that opportunity a little bit in 2008, where we almost went backwards. Um, that people shifted away from, um, we, we saw this kind of gutting out of construction workers, especially um, in, in skilled trades. Um, and, uh, and so we were it, it not in, in, in a worse position to then be able to kind of move into the future. Um, so, um, so I think that's going to be, that, that's critical here. And Alison, I would just add, you know, riffing off what Cindy and Nick are saying that you know, really the focus to me of Bay Area leaders needs to be that triple bottom line. Um, so obviously economic stimulus, environmental sustainability, but also equity. And I've just observed, you know, the superheated economy in the Bay Area obviously has uh, helped a lot of people, but it's also obviously exacerbated inequity and led to this large diaspora of people that can't afford to live in the Bay Area. And so what an opportunity, you know, Cindy invoked the WPA um, to you know, make sure that our stimulus actually generates high road jobs and really builds careers. So we, you know, in you all in the Bay Area can really tackle head on this sort of growing income inequality. Uh, it just seems like such an important moment to do that. And you know, if we're gonna make a silver lining of this crisis and all the economic pain that it's created, um, let's think big around truly how to integrate that stimulus with sustainability, but also also uh, economic uh, equity. Great, wonderful responses, so much to think about. Um, the good news is we have a lot of audience interest in uh, coming in with questions and the bad news is not a lot of time, so I'm gonna urge uh, brief responses to the next question, um, but I, I still wanna make sure we hear from all of you on this who, who want to respond. So question three, during the shelter requirements, we've uh, seen a, a deep reduction in traffic and air pollution, which Andrea mentioned. And when the order is lifted, what kind of fresh, bold ideas um, can you think of or that you've already heard from some of our large employers thinking big uh, to get people out of their cars, to improve traffic and reduce air and water pollution from our roads? And what can um, policymakers do to support these efforts? So um, I, this is one I'm very excited about. And, and here's why. I think we have an opportunity to teach people how to use transport, public transportation. And we have a number of companies and public sector employers like ourselves. We're 22,000 employees in the county of Santa Clara. And I want us to not have everybody ever have to go back to work at, and be able to work remotely. And the, the importance of that is that we've already seen like a 28% reduction in CO2 emissions, 70% reduction in traffic, 38% reduction in NOx, 20% reduction in fine particulate matter. Wouldn't it be great if especially our large employers could figure out a way to keep people to be able to work remotely wherever that remote place is, to really drop the number of trips we take a day. And we, we're learning how to do it. And it would be terrible to waste all this great learning, these great tools that we're getting, these great tools that are getting refined, and go back to the way it was. And so one of the things I'd like to see is large employers take a pledge to not ha ever have at least a third of their folks go back to work. I mean, I want them to work remotely. 
And, and I think if we do that, it would make even more sense to start opening up those kinds of companies that are willing to keep a majority or, you know, come back slowly, but keep as many people as they can working remotely. I think that would be hmm. life altering for our community. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree uh, more with Supervisor Chavez. Uh, like everyone, I've in, enjoyed uh, the, uh, the ease in which you can drive in the Bay Area. And more importantly, I've uh, really enjoyed the clean air and the wonderful environmental uh, aspects. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been said that, you know, maybe COVID-19 was Mother Earth telling everyone to go to their rooms because they've treated the environment so badly. Um, and it gives us maybe a taste of what the world would be like if we lowered our carbon emissions substantially. As to telecommuting, which we uh, definitely now have to embrace, the question is how much of that will be done because people now appreciate its benefits more versus how much will, will require uh, in, uh, incentives um, or, or requirements through uh, legislation. When we think about the infrastructure money that will become available, you know, perhaps some of that could be, could be used to provide extra incentives for this, at least for a short period of time, just to drive home uh, or help people uh, you know, continue this pattern. Is if just five percent of us uh, work from home, uh, you know, one day a month, or even a modest shift, would have tremendous benefits for traffic congestion, and tremendous benefits for CO two reduction. So I, I think we definitely have to put think hard about what mechanisms we can um, come up with to make sure this happens. I'm not entirely sure people will do it won't rush back to the old ways. I, uh, but I think they're very open to thinking about doing it differently. But some incentives or some sticks may be needed. Well, I, I, I think Dave and Cindy are right on the money. And you know, today is the one year anniversary of the governor's future of work task force. And so you know, we're really driving ourselves in, in Sacramento uh, in the Newsom administration to think about what is the future of work and how do we generate those high road jobs in ways that you know, are sustainable environmentally and economically. In our agency, about 20,000 people, we had almost no telecommuting before this uh, crisis. And as a result, we moved the vast majority of our office workers, um, so not the CAL FIRE firefighters or the state parks rangers, but you know the office folks out of the office. And we've had a really good experience. And uh, we are capturing sort of what's worked, what hasn't worked, but what's worked. And something I've said is let's demonstrate we can remain productive via telework. And if, and if we can be, I'm really excited in our agency to actually uh, enable vastly more teleworking. Likewise, uh, we had an agency-wide license for DocuSign for electronic signatures that was seldom used. And we actually required wet signatures on everything. That's completely transformed in the last six weeks. And entities across the state are out now actually, you know, um, finalizing grants and contracts and permits, et cetera, via e-signature, which is gonna also have an environmental benefit. So I actually think we need to look to figure out what is the silver lining of, uh, of changes in the workplace and then institutionalize them post COVID. All right, I hate to step in and, or step on people's toes who had something else to offer, but I did wanna to get to a couple of the audience questions before we have to move on, thank you all for those responses. So the first question actually is right back to you, Secretary Crowfoot, um, regarding the first question, which is uh, directly asking for your assessment of the possibility that the state legislature will put forward the climate bond, job stimulus bond, or hybrid uh, this fall. So sort of honing in on the likelihood there. I mean, it's, I think it's a question that nobody can answer, and it's a conversation that's happening in real time. Well, that's going to happen really over the next four weeks. So again, the legislature is coming back to Sacramento. Um, they and the governor need to work together to um, pass a balanced budget by the end of June. It's likely that other legislative business um, uh, needs to be conducted uh, in that time frame, including a bond, because for a November bond to be put on the ballot, you really need to do that by, by uh, late June, mid-July. 
um, there has been strong indications of interest from legislative leadership uh, and very much open-mindedness from the, the Newsom administration. But I think we're, we're in uncharted waters um, fiscally, you know, to be quite honest. And I think, you know, we're still assessing sort of the impact on the state's general fund and what that means for our budget. Um, so I can't give you some uh, confidence or, you know, percentage chance of the bond going on. I know it will be an active topic. Um, and if, you know, stakeholders, um, want to be involved in that discussion, that public dialogue, you should, you should make your voice heard because that decision really w about the November ballot really will get made in the next month. Thank you. And, oh, I uh, just wanted to mention that that was from um, Josh Hug, uh, Joshua Hug at uh, MidPen. Uh, did you have something quickly to add, Deborah? I just wanted to add quickly because I know this, it's so easy for this conversation to go down the rabbit hole of telecommuting and and actually a whole telecommuting TDM is why I got involved in transportation. And, and this is a whole area I'm very passionate about. But I just don't want us to lose sight of the fact that we've got to look at multimodal options. We can't think telecommuting is going to solve everything. So let's not take the foot off the gas. We're working with our major employers to relocate in the right places, to offer TDM measures, to support transit. Here, here. <laughs> okay, so time for lightning round responses. This, uh, this question is from Kathleen Thomas. I've heard speakers from different panels refer to uh, the need for increased federal funding. I've also heard the president threaten to withhold funding and support for sanctuary cities. How do we respond to those threats? Again, lightning round responses on this one. My well, own take is ca California, <laughs> California shouldn't sacrifice its values, um, that we should, you know, ask our federal government to support us with our own taxpayer dollars and expect that they're going to treat us equally and not um, uh, inject politics in at this critical moment. Well said. Yeah, and um, I want to emphasize, we, we have to protect our communities of concern. We have to look at everything through an equity lens. And we want to make sure that we're not just pursuing what the, you know, convenient dollars are the federal government's throwing at us, but we're really advocating for the fact that we're providing options to all in our community. I think uh, California never uh, blinked when we heard those threats from uh, Washington in the past and we won't be uh, changing our approach. Okay, I'm taking a moment of silence to move on to question three unless anyone had anything burning to add. Okay, question three is from Teresa Alvarado at Spur. She asks, they need to address, let's see, sorry, let me paraphrase here. Um, can you please address uh, the safety concerns uh, around housing and on office density and mass transit? You know, the, the concern now that because of social distancing being the uh, approach that we're taking to protect ourselves, what does that mean then for, um, for efforts to in, in increase uh, density to uh, protect environmental quality in our region. So I'll, I'll jump on this one representing VTA. I think there's a couple of aspects here. One is, you know, we're all recognizing the effects of the pandemic, but also that this is not gonna be a permanent state of being. So while there are measures we're taking now to protect at VTA to protect our employees, protect our bus operators, to protect our passengers, these requirements won't stay in place. Also, when it comes to denser development, I mean, you can have pretty dense development without being within six feet of each other. So hopefully all of our living spaces allow us more than, you know, a hula hoop or with my son, I use his hockey stick to make sure nobody's within six feet of me. Um, but I, I do think it means that we need to keep looking at, um, I want to echo what uh, well, I called her board chair, Chavez, <laughs> said about um, staying, um, staying the course of looking at you know, how we do denser development and equity, um, but this, you know, we need to keep in that direction. You know, I also wanna say that this is an opportunity for public transportation really to stand out. And what I mean by that is to, we're clean, we're efficient, and, and 
And I think that this gives us an opportunity to reintroduce ourselves to a lot of folks who, would, who don't want to get in their cars. They don't want to destroy what they're, like, think about all the gains we've made. Um, and I think Andrea said it best that even, we're even seeing more animals in our area. So I think this is an opportunity for a mass reintroduction. And I think all of our public transit agencies in the region can start to make the case that we're clean, we're fast, we're safe, you know, join us. I, I do think though, you know, for the foreseeable future, it, it's going to make it very, very difficult for, for public transit to return to their prior uh, occupancy and passenger count. When you, when you think of Caltrain, for example, which was, you know, moving 65,000 people a day, standing room only, it's gonna take a while until people feel comfortable backing trains like that again. And when you look at Caltrain or BART that are very dependent on passenger fares, it's going to be a good long while for us to get back to that point. So, you know, so, some sectors are going to need a little longer, uh, um, you know, you know, through the various uh, stimulus stimulus acts. You know, even if that shelter in place was lifted tomorrow, you know, people know that you know COVID will be having a major effect in our lives you know, for a year or more, what's the willingness of people to pack themselves onto Cal Trainer BART right now? Probably, probably low. So it's a short term challenge. And if well, I can just jump in, Alison, I think, you know, thank you, Teresa, for the question. Um, it's, I, I think that we, we would make a real mistake if we attributed, um, if we, if we thought that um, residential density was one of the drivers of COVID. Um, I think what with the, the, the county in the United States with the highest rate of COVID infections is Randolph County in Georgia. Um, and there are a few places that are more, that are more rural um, than, uh, than Randolph. It's in Southwestern Georgia. Um, and even in the New York City area, the counties that have the highest death rates per capita are actually the suburban counties um, are, are not the counties in uh, the five counties in New York City. Um, and um, I think what we're actually seeing is that crowding is some, is um, is uh, is a real um, risk factor for COVID nineteen. Um, it's not um, how many houses you have per acre; it's how many people you have in a house. Mm. Uh, and in um, our regions, in in especially in 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 places in the Bay Area, um, there are um it, you know entire communities especially of low income people people of color immigrants who are crowded into houses because we have not been able to build enough housing um we have not been able to build enough affordable housing we have not been able to build enough density so that each family can have their own home um and i think the big takeaway that we have to take is that actually um, we will be safer if we can make build more density and give people their own home than force them into having to share with other families um, in such close conditions. Thank you for that. I really want to continue this conversation. It's, it's just warming up in my opinion, but unfortunately I'm gonna have to um, end it uh, by thanking all of our panelists very much uh, and turning it over to our closer this afternoon. Greg, are yeah, you? I am, I am here. Let's see if I can get myself unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, there we go. Start my video. There we go. Okay, so not so much density there. <laughs> a little bit of uh, a nice image for us to think about. Um, as we, as I heard all the panelists, wow, this was an amazing panel. I'm going to start with. Nick's comment first, his last one. It's safer if there's more density if people are in their own homes. And then I'm going to back to the first where Cindy was talking about, can we go back to a win-win-win? And it's really going to that triple bottom line of the you know, people, places, planet, uh, going to what Deborah was saying, we need to look at multimodal uh, models through an equity lens that yes, we will be having more people. Hopefully we'll have incentives for people to work from home and thus reduce traffic. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to look at economic stimulus. And that economic stimulus 
there's a little bit of difference there. Some are saying, let's go with the big uh, projects. Uh, Nick was saying, let's do a lot of little ones. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily too much disagreement that let's go with something that can be, um, as they said, the last round shovel ready, that can uh, be good for the environment, be good for jobs, and be good for the economy. Um, so all of this is saying that we're well positioned for equity and uh, resilience uh, in, in the community. Uh, listening to Wade saying, local leaders, uh, get your house in order around these regional priorities, because we do have cohesive leadership around those priorities. Look at uh, things like the learnings from the Great Depression, from WPA that's, that Cindy said. And uh, what I uh, take away from her is be disciplined and quick, save lives and the environment. I will close with uh, this feast of uh, St. Joseph, the patron saint of San Jose, uh, with a, a little reference to Pope Francis. Uh, Carl, you'll have to forgive me, I'm a good Catholic boy. Pope Francis, uh, this is the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, which is care for our common home. So if we want to be resilient, if we want to be sustainable, we need to make sure that those who are the poorest in our community have the same equitable access to those that the rest of us in the community have. Thank you, Greg Kefferly. And for this amazing panel of resilient communities, I wanna thank our moderator as well. We want to hear from you on some of the pressing issues that we face in a COVID-19 climate in our interactive fashion at our regional economic forum. To poll our hundreds of participants, please welcome the Regional Vice President of the Northern California Hospital Council, Joe Cafaro. When Joe is done with our polling, we will immediately go in to our closing TED-style keynote from State Controller Betty Yee and an interactive conversation on stage with State Controller Betty Yee. So don't go away after these polling questions are asked. Joe Cafaro. Yes, hello, I hope you could hear me just fine. Great, so good afternoon. So uh, this is our first question. The Bay Area experienced many public safety power shutoffs last year. To help reduce the number of outages needed this year, as well as to avoid potential future outages, future wildfires, California will require an extensive investment in the grid, including seasonalizing uh, the power lines and a uh, clean re resilient solution of like microgrids, solar and storage and, ve and vehicle to grid power from electric vehicles. Are you willing to do the following? So are you willing to pay more for these solutions? Please answer the following questions. I'll let you give you a few seconds to answer and then we'll move to number two. So it looks like the polls are coming in and several of you, many of you, are supporting number one. Give you a few more minutes. Thank you very much. Keep those questions Keep on answering. I know that we have a lot more participations, a few more people that are on that haven't answered, so please do. All right, so we'll move to the second one. Because of health precautions related to COVID-19, most workers have had training from working from home and companies have had the opportunity to evaluate how productive their employees are in teams. It has also led to record drops in traffic and pollution. The leadership group is working to determine what can and will be done to lock in what can be done to help um, determine if this is a new way of doing business. So we'd like to know, um, what are you guys thinking about? What is your company thinking about? Are you thinking about doing these policies? And please answer the question.
And in case anyone can't see the screen, those choices for question two, uh, we will likely expand our work from home policies. That's one choice. Our policy yeah. currently allows employees to work from home to some extent, but we are not considering increasing or expanding that policy. That's choice two. And choice three, due to the nature of our business, we have generally not permitted employees to have flexible work arrangements and are not considering altering that policy. Thank you, Carl. I couldn't see it on my screen. <laughs> my pleasure, Joe. We have about 15 the, seconds for you to vote before Joe goes to the third question. So then we will go to question number three. Question number three is in this admin Amidst the uh, COVID-19 crisis, how much of a priority should climate change remain over the next one to three years? Keep it a high priority. It is important, but there are, but there are other things we need to prioritize or not important at all. Please answer your questions for number three. And it looks like it's coming in and a lot of you are saying that it's a high priority. So that is excellent. And I'm not sure if everyone can see their screen, but it looks like um, for question number one, you folks would be looking to support the additional measures. And I can't see number two. And if Carl, if you could read the outcome number two, that would be great. The outcome of number two is how likely is your organization to consider adopting more flexible work arrangements? 73%, we will likely expand our work from home policy. And that would be wonderful news going back to board president Chavez challenge to each of us that the leadership group readily accepts. Great, thank you. And 77% of folks had said that it's a high priority um, that we should, um, regarding climate change question. Um, so that is good news too. And I will go ahead and pass it on over back to you, Carl. Joe Cafaro, thank you for your leadership at the Ho Hospital Council of Northern California and also for being a partner with our Regional Economic Forum. We're so excited about our closing TED style talk keynote speaker. Uh, we are going to ask Linda Mandolini, the CEO of Eden Housing, to introduce our special guest and the person who will be interviewing our special guest after her brief TED style talk. And that is the president for California of United Airlines, Janet Lampkin. Linda Mandolini, will you please introduce our special guest, Betty Yi? Great, thank you, Carl. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, our closing keynote speaker today, the State Controller Betty Yi. Controller Yi is California's Chief Fiscal Officer and serves as the state's accountant and bookkeeper of all public funds. In this capacity, she serves on 76 boards and commissions, including the Board of Equalization, the Franchise Tax Board, CalPERS, CalSTRS, and my personal favorites, the Tax Credit Allocation and Debt Limit Allocation Committees, both of which make significant contributions to affordable housing in the state. Prior to her statewide leadership as state controller, Betty served on the Board of Equalization. She is a first-generation American born to parents who immigrated here from Guangdong province in China. Betty was raised in San Francisco and got an early start on her career as controller, handling the books in her family's neighborhood laundry and dry cleaning businesses. After controller, Yi's brief, after Controller Yi's brief TED style talk, we will be joined by a virtual onstage interview for a virtual onstage interview with the California president of United States Airlines, uh, sorry, pardon me, United Airlines and long-term community leader, Janet Lamkin. Please join, join me in welcoming State Controller Yi. Thank you very much, Linda. Good afternoon, everyone. So I wanted to first just uh, thank um, 
the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and to all of the uh, co-hosts and sponsors for a really uh, wonderful regional economic forum today. And what I'd like to do is to try to wrap up a number of the themes that we've heard today. So uh, let me um, just uh, begin by saying that we are in just unprecedented times. You know, to combat the devastating impacts of uh, the novel coronavirus, uh, we have seen governments, and rightly so, really focused on uh, solving the health crisis and saving lives. But what I think we're focused on today and what I've heard just so much as a common theme here today is really the uh, lasting issue of saving livelihoods. And uh, we also must address that at the same time. Uh, the current economic hardships are dire. Uh, the number of California unemployment claims uh, now exceeds the number of jobs that were created uh, during the recovery after the Great Recession. And we expect another wave of layoffs as small and medium businesses uh, likely will occur uh, when uh, they are unable to secure financial relief in a timely manner. And so we have, I, with every crisis, I think uh, one of the um, wonderful uh, attributes of California, and this is where I hope we can really capitalize on this at this really difficult time, is that we have a significant role to play to see where we have some opportunities with respect to what our economy looks like going forward. And what I've been uh, really very, very focused on is uh, not only what we have to do to stay safe and healthy every day, including with my own employees at the state controller's office, but certainly uh, within my community and my neighborhood and in my family. Uh, it is fair to say that uh, I think all of us are really anticipating uh, with a little bit of unease about what this economy is gonna look like when we do recover. But I do think California, because we are the home of innovation, we are definitely the home of this can-do attitude, uh, is uh, really in a prime role to look at uh, how we can uh, lead, uh, how we future-proof our economy. One of the things that we've learned from this uh, pandemic is just how vulnerable our economy is with so many workers who uh, were really undergirding uh, the economy for so many other industries. And so as we look at these unemployment claims continue to rise, we know that many of these workers uh, really carried a, a heavy weight and um, not able to continue uh, working during this crisis. And so when I talk about future-proofing the economy, uh, I think most of us think about that concept as applying to uh, industrial design. And yet, uh, uh, and, and, and rightfully so, because when we talk about industrial design, we wanna be sure that uh, we're uh, building things and really creating um, structures that can withstand the shocks and the stresses uh, of unanticipated events. And when I think about this pandemic, uh, this is really, I think, a concept we can borrow with respect to how we re rebuild our economy, that we have to gird against economic shocks and stresses uh, of this pandemic and going forward, uh, hopefully learn from the lessons that uh, we are seeing every day that present themselves every day uh, during this crisis about how we re rebuild this economy for resilience and uh, for sustainability, but also for how we protect our human and our natural capital. And this is a theme that uh, I know my office and I, with regard to the different roles that I serve on the various boards and commissions, will be very, very focused on to start looking at how we uh, continue to stay prepared and ready uh, with systems hardening. You know, when we looked at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, we saw that our public health infrastructure was ill prepared to respond to this. And part of how we recover from this economy has to be about how we strengthen that infrastructure because so many of the issues that uh, we're gonna be facing with respect to climate change, and I'm so happy that we've had an opportunity to talk about that this, uh, during this forum, will be the very issues that will present new public health uh, challenges. Uh, when we talk about um, our food supply and uh, food security and our water quality and the air that we're breathing, all and chronic health conditions attendant to all of that, this is all part of the public health infrastructure that we need to continue to shore up uh, in California. So future-proofing the economy must include hardening our public health infrastructure. But it also needs to address uh, climate change uh, because of our um, uniqueness in California where we have an abundance of natural and working lands. And so as we think about uh, how we look at uh, dealing with uh, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, how we look at dealing with our, our, our carbon um, uh, uh, issues. Our, our uh, natural lands and our working lands are a big solution in terms of uh, either carbon capture, sequestration, uh, looking at different ways that we are going to look at our agricultural lands, uh, looking at how we can have uh, even uh, regional agricultural sectors develop uh, because we know that uh, uh, for food security purposes that that will be something that we'll need to explore. 
But more importantly, I believe that the uh, pandemic and how we overcome and see the other side of this pandemic is really incumbent upon our workers. And I think all of us really care a lot about uh, certainly not enough opportunities to thank our frontline health workers and other essential workers right now. And let me just say the word essential, um, I hope we lose that from the lexicon because uh, most work is essential, all work is essential during a crisis. And I do believe that uh, when we look at how we get to the other side of this pandemic, it has to be focused on workers. Uh, Secretary Crowfoot earlier talked about the Governor's Future of Work Commission. Uh, on which I've had the opportunity to uh, participate. And uh, we know that uh, when we talk about the possibility of uh, high road employment uh, throughout California, how we look at uh, really um, being more worker centric relative to um, building that security for, for workers in all sectors of our economy. This is the work we need to focus on. And, and how we look at providing all of that will mean uh, some bold leadership, some different ways of thinking, but just as we responded to the pandemic and really leading, uh, I would say, in this country and around the world with respect to our response, our governor being visible every day with factual information, resources to help people, uh, to really aggressive with our federal government and bringing those federal dollars to California uh, to be sure that we are just at every turn responding to every aspect of this crisis that presents itself every day. Uh, we need swift, decisive action with respect to how we're going to move forward in this economy as well. So what I'd like to say is this. Um, I am the controller of California. I care a lot about our state's finances. Uh, we are uh, actually doing um, pretty well fiscally as we speak today because of all of the discipline that former Governor Jerry Brown, our current Governor Gavin Newsom, our state legislature has really put in place with respect to our uh, fiscal structure. We have historic reserves and this is where we started out when we uh, began to shelter in place and really uh, take a look at uh, all of the economic um, downturns that took place in every sector. Uh, we have pushed out uh, income tax receipts till July so we will have some uh, uh, cash pressures. Uh, but we also will have some uh, budget pressures as well, as we know that this economy, until it is fully productive again, uh, will uh, really hurt uh, relative to budgetary resources available uh, for critical public services. But what I want to say is this to, to end this. We have an opportunity to really begin to address uh, issues of equity as, um, as we had talked about in this last panel. When we look at the investments going forward, and I would say that uh, even as your CFO, I, I hope that we can look at still talking about making investments at the same time that we're trying to be prudent with our budgetary resources. This economy is going to recover, uh, and we have to help it recover at the same time that we are having to spend money to be sure that people's livelihoods are still intact. And so to really uh, attain equity, I would hope that many of our investments going forward will be place-based to really understand that we have had decades of really disinvestment in so many areas of California. When we look at uh, broadband access, the fact that we're here in California, this is the home of technology and we still don't have uh, universal um, high-speed broadband access in California. So the need for place-based uh, investments, uh, the need to be sure that we are uh, creating community partnerships, uh, establishing and hardening that public health infrastructure, looking at how we put our working and natural lands to work uh, in a better way for our environment, uh, looking at uh, securing our small businesses, medium, small and medium sized businesses. These are going to be the entrepreneurs who will be helping us to disseminate uh, climate technology and, and other needs of the future. And, and more importantly, uh, we have to look at investments that really speak to how we are going to restore a a really tall sense of economic security in Californians. And to do that, I believe that we need to also at the same time rebuild trust. And if there's anything that I think this pandemic has done, we have seen just uh, wonderful, I believe, silver linings that have come out of uh, just uh, uh, the fact that we are in one of the most difficult times in our history. And that is people really making that extra effort to connect. Uh, people extending uh, gestures of kindness that probably in uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we didn't see um, that um, being that uh, demonstrable. And then also looking at uh, how we really have come to realize with this pandemic that uh, each of us is essential to the other. That in order for us to really get to the other side of this pandemic, not only are we sheltering in place, looking out for our own health and safety, uh, and uh, looking at practicing physical distancing, 
but this is the way that we are going to ensure that we are taking care of ourselves, not harming others, and we encourage others to do the same so that we can really look at how we get to the other side of this crisis. And so when I think about um, really what's in store for California, we will have some very, very difficult um, budget discussions going forward. Our revenues will be um, uh, severely constrained for a period of time. But I am uh, one, and I think this is something that all of us uh, here involved with the Regional Economic Forum truly believe, uh, and that's the spirit of California has always carried us through um, from crisis to crisis. And this one may be unprecedented, but we also know that uh, what we need to do here. And as I say, with a crisis comes opportunity. Um, this is something that I know uh, will present many, many opportunities, but let's get this right. I think we have a tremendous opportunity, uh, as has been expressed by so many of the speakers today, uh, to really make a major, major improvement with respect to how we attain social and economic and environmental equity for all of California. And so I really, really look forward to uh, being a partner with all of you in this endeavor. And uh, let's not lose sight of the fact that um, our richest, richest asset in California is our tremendous diversity. And uh, again, I still, even in this, during this pandemic, I wake up every morning just uh, so blessed that uh, we live here in California, the home to the greatest diversity, where diversity is our greatest strength and not a threat. And that will be demonstrated over and over again as we continue to focus on recovering our economy and building that economy so that it is resilient, it is sustainable, and that it is providing opportunities for every Californian up and down the state. Thank you, State Controller Betty Yee. We are going to ask for Janet Lankin, the president of California for United Airlines to come on to our virtual stage for questions and conversation. Janet Lamkin. Thank you so much, Carl, and also Controller Yi. thank you so much, uh, first of all, for your leadership um, over the years in our state. You've been such a leader of policy and community issues, and we are so delighted and privileged that you're in the role that you're in right now during this incredible crisis. Um, so we thank you very much for your leadership and those comments, and I particularly love the comments about the spirit of California and how we can use that spirit to come out of this in a much more equitable um, fashion. So with that, we've got a few questions for you and then we're gonna take some questions from everyone on here. Um, but I thought I'd start obviously uh, at United, this, um, you know, the travel industry has been hit very, very hard. Many industries have, but, and travel's been hit very, very hard by this crisis. And given how important travel and tourism is here in the state, um, both in, to enable our businesses to operate and to bring tourism to California for small businesses and others, I would love to see and hear your uh, thoughts around what steps you think we ought to take around reopening and then once we reopen, um, just what those next steps might be. Absolutely, it's great to see you, Janet, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think um, you know, one of the things that I've been very, very um, just in tune with is just, um, you know, just Californians' um, attitude about, um, you know, what's happening during this time. And, you know, one of the things that has struck me uh, is really how um, this virus, because it is the novel coronavirus, we know still very little about it, and we are learning every day um, just something new about it. But uh, what that suggests to me is that um, not only are uh, California's economic security being tested, but also our health and safety security. And I think so much of um, you know, travel and tourism, and believe me, there is a lot of pent up frustration to get back into being able to move and to uh, go to places and to certainly, uh, I, I think this will not be a sector that will be uh, uh, lacking activity when we get to the other side of the pandemic. On the other hand, I do think there is, uh, this is the time to really demonstrate certainly those in the travel and tourism industry that uh, we are very serious about health and safety. Uh, to really be um, very, very um, outward and very visible about measures that are being taken so that by the time that we get to the other side of this pandemic, uh, there is no uh, lead time. We are at the ready. We are, at the, you know, we are up, to, up to date with respect to all the precautions that need to be taken. And it is going to be a new normal. I mean, I think this is a virus that um, by all counts is going to be with us for a while. And so it may be that we'll have to fly with masks on. Uh, it may be that we will have to distance on a plane. Um, but uh, I think I would 
venture to say that Californians really would uh, uh, prefer to have the option of traveling and to be able to and to have uh, people from outside of California come uh, to California, um, knowing that they can be safe here and that uh, we have taken every single precaution. And I think uh, with this industry, it's always been at the forefront uh, of that. We we open our doors here to, uh, in California to so many other parts of the world. And uh, I think, uh, as I said, there will be no lack of activity with respect to people wanting to, to travel within the state and certainly for those outside of California to come in. Well, great. We're looking forward to that as well. Um, and I'll just say it, we did our uh, earnings today and our new president was talking about the fact that no industry has had better record on safety than airlines, really in terms of just knowing how to do it. And so that's one topic that there's a lot of actual collaboration on is to ensure that customers are safe. So Good. appreciate that. Um, among your service on literally 76 boards and commissions on, in the state, which is phenomenal and hard to imagine, um, you two very prominent and incredibly important one is CalPERS and CalSTRS, um, which has a combined pre-COVID uh, assets of 570 billion under management, which is really extraordinary. So I'm curious to know what you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities for those two really important pension funds in this economic climate. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, the challenge really every day of the pension funds is to be sure that we can pay the benefits that have been earned by our educators and public sector workforce. And, and of course, as we look at um, the impacts of this pandemic and really any global event, uh, it will have impacts on our portfolio. And so, uh, and actually, um, just by way of an update, prior to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we our assets actually uh, got up to about uh, combined $620 billion. So we're doing very, very well. Uh, I think there are a couple things to watch for. Um, one is just uh, how prolonged uh, this uh, pandemic will be. Uh, how soon can we get people back to work? There are certainly some asset classes within both of the funds that we are watching very, very closely. Obviously, real estate, uh, commercial real estate, um, what people have had to do in terms of um, uh, the usage of uh, commercial real estate during this time. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, just the impacts of the dropping oil prices um, and what that means across uh, different industries and supply chains. And uh, also um, looking at uh, what companies are doing in terms of just um, planning uh, for things like this. Um, you know, this is, um, this is probably um, heightening, I think, a lot of what uh, a lot of companies are beginning to talk about relative to uh, their own business operations, what are considered to be risks to their uh, business operations. I know uh, the pension funds were not alone, but certainly joined with so many others around the world are looking at climate risk. Uh, this is a different kind of risk, and I hope that uh, uh, we do uh, continue to pay attention. This has uh, really uh, much broader implications real time and certainly across the, uh, the, spans of, the span of the portfolio. So uh, this will be uh, really just a lot of um, just uh, really detailed monitoring. Uh, we are rebalancing the portfolio, our investment staff um, daily, uh, and this is probably going to last for uh, the better part of, uh, I would say, the remainder of this year, uh, just to get some stability. But one thing I will say is this. Um, I think uh, the fact that we have um, uh, many of our beneficiaries who are able to um, get um, retirement checks, uh, that's a plus. I mean, they still can count on those. Um, uh, we have good liquidity in both funds, and so uh, those payments will continue to be made. All right. Thank you. Um, one of the best parts of California is our wonderful history of immigrants and their families. Um, and you're a first-generation American born to two parents who immigrated here from China. And as we learned in the, the, um, we, your bio, you were raised in San Francisco and you handled the books uh, in your family's neighborhood laundry business, which is so terrific. Um, and what I'm curious what compelled your parents to leave China and what it was like for you to grow up in San Francisco and in a state in which English is your second language, what that experience was like. Sure, no, thank you, Janet, for the question because I think it's so relevant today given the certainly the, the rich diversity we have here in, in uh, California. Um, you know, it wasn't really a choice for my father. Um, his family essentially kicked him out at the age of 14. Uh, he was in a prearranged marriage with my mother and uh, essentially his, his parents, my grandparents told my father, you have no future here. Um, really, um, you go to the United States, he had a couple bucks in his pocket, he was 14 years old. Uh, came to the United States and learned the laundry business in San Francisco Chinatown and eventually opened up his own. Uh, but really what um, 
I think compels um, so many to think about, you know, coming to the United States, to California particularly, is the opportunity. And there's a, um, a, a, a Cantonese uh, saying called uh, Gim San, which means a gold mountain. And uh, that was always just kind of the, um, the vision uh, that so many in the home village had for their, for their children, was to be able to get to the gold mountain so that opportunities could open for them to raise their families and to have a better life than uh, what they had experienced on their own. You know, growing up in the neighborhood in San Francisco, um, I, uh, I'm the oldest of six children uh, in the family. And uh, of course, with a, any kind of family business, the children are the best employees. I still say it's the best job I've had. Uh, <laughs> It, is, it was a wonderful experience. Um, the street where my parents' business um, was located were all uh, descendants from Europe. Um, there were four Chinese American families. We're all small business owners, all with the same dream that we just wanted to provide a better life for our family. So it was a wonderfully close-knit community. Uh, it was primarily an Irish Catholic community. And so many of our customers were our firefighters, our police officers, many in the trades. And, and, uh, but it was a wonderfully rich, close-knit community that just cared about the well-being of each other. And it's uh, what I'm seeing really with this pandemic now, that um, we're coming back to that, that uh, as mobile as we have all been you know, between when I grew up to now, uh, just the idea that we are connecting in different ways and really you know, caring for the well-being of each other um, is just something that I think is a value that um, is going to get us through um, these difficult times. That's great. Wonderful story. Thank you. Um, Carl, do we have uh, some, some um, questions? Oh, I, here's one. Okay. This is um, Jay Gaucher from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And the question is, how do you foresee the next steps to support small businesses specifically in California post shelter in place? You know, this has been um, really something I cared a lot about, obviously, because of my own background. Um, you know, we always talk about small businesses as being uh, the lifeblood of the community and obviously creating jobs and, and uh, also, uh, by the way, a real um, entree into the economy by many immigrant um, uh, families as well. Um, I, I, I would hope that there would be um, a lot more support for small businesses where um, our local governments can really begin to provide uh, for the needs of small businesses. Um, you know, when you looked at how many, uh, how many have shuttered since this pandemic, uh, it suggested to me a couple of things. One, um, how, how on the margins so many of them are operating. And maybe they got to get started, but when they uh, actually start to grow and expand that, um, you know, just in terms of scaling up, um, expenses are also scaling up. And so there's just really not an ability to keep up uh, with, with increased costs. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I would say that um, in terms of uh, just any kind of um, tax relief or other relief that we um, uh, are thinking about that we ought not think um, lose sight of our small businesses. Oftentimes it's our large companies, but when you look at uh, who the suppliers are, you know, who so many of those that fuel so many other parts of the economy are, uh, they generally are our small businesses. And so I hope that with this kind of reset that we're in right now, that uh, we can uh, really put uh, more prominence and importance on uh, those businesses that really have uh, been able to fuel the success of so many other sectors in the economy. All right, great. Um, all righty. Yeah, go right ahead, Carl. Thank you, Janet Lambkin, President of California for United Airlines, as well as our state controller, Betty Yi, who has always been a mentor and role model for so many of us, myself included. I had goosebumps when you spoke earlier about your father coming at 14 with just a few dollars in his pocket. That immigrant story is the story of so many of us and our parents and the role that immigrants have played to bless our communities and their own families. Thank you, Controller Betty Yee. I'd like, to, I'd like to mention, we live in very unique times. It's more imperative than ever that we lift up our communities, our economy, our neighborhoods, and ourselves. That also means, again, taking care of our own loved ones and ourselves. As I remind my colleagues at the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, our role is threefold through this COVID-19 challenge. We serve our members, we serve our communities, and we serve each other to be stronger through this experience. It's been a pleasure to partner with our 24 equally branded co-hosts to receive the amazing support of our branded co-sponsors 
and to connect and to communicate with each of you, nearly 400 participants today, to better ensure that we rebuild a vibrant economy that benefits all of us. Thank you for participating in our ninth annual Regional Economic Forum. We could not have had a more fitting close than to hear from State Controller Betty Yee and United Airlines President for California, Janet Lamkin. It's a pleasure to serve our region and our state with each of you. We wish you health and safety as we come through this time together. Thank you all. And before we close, I want to thank Shannon Diatley Johnson on our team who pivoted and made this possible through a virtual format with her colleagues, Pam Kelly, with Megan White, with Kelly Kirkendall, and so many others who made this format possible. That's what we do in Silicon Valley. When a door is locked, we open a, we open a window or we build a new door, and that is precisely what we did today. Again, thanks to each of you. Goodbye.